So at this time, I'd like to introduce up our speaker, Ed Savoso. You know, many of you know him as kind of a renowned theologist, business guy, um, author, founder of Transformation of the World Hawaii. Um, but the two things that really has impressed me about him is, um, one, his heart for his wife, his heart for his four daughters and his grandchildren, the way that he, um, yeah, really pours out the love of Jesus on his family. And two is um, the Lord just showed me that this is a man that is someone we all esteem to be, um, but it's come through long, long steps of simple obedience um, and that he's had the faith to really start in very small ways. And it just today is just bearing so much fruit. So if you could help me to welcome up Ed Savoso to the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Amen. Please uh, remain standing for the moment. Uh, you know, today we all have a big challenge ahead of us. Hawaii is hurting because of the fire and the loss. But God is not absent in Hawaii. All things work together for good. I have been texting with our intercessors in Argentina. <clears throat> you know how many? 22,000 intercessors are on double duty praying for this moment because this is a historical day. In history, today, 60 years of Martin Luther King's famous speech, I have a dream. I mean, that day, I mean, even though the press doesn't call it an ecclesia meeting, it was an ecclesia meeting. If you watch the video, all the pastors that are all around, Martin Luther King Jr. himself was a pastor, and he's injecting into America the leaven of justice, social justice. It took time, but he did it. Today here, in this place, I received from God that East and West in Honolulu are coming together. <laughs> that the Philemons and the Onesimus are coming together. You see, the early church, the Ecclesia in the book of Acts, yes, it performed signs and wonders. People got saved, got healed. But there is something else the church did that no one else did, and it was social justice. First of all, elevated woman to a peerage with men. Second, Paul calls Philemon a son. He's a wealthy guy. Onesimus, a runaway slave, my son. And he said, I'm sending him back to you so that you will be brothers. That was radical. When in the New Testament we read the worker is worthy of his pay, that is even more radical than the French Revolution or the Bolshevik Revolution because over 90% of the people were either slaves or indentured workers. Something was introduced that eventually allowed Martin Luther King to speak to the conscience of America. And I declare to you folks, that this gathering here today is a divine set up for you to speak to Hawaii, for you to speak to this nation, for you to bring the have and the have nots, to, for you to bring them together and create a new order in Hawaii. So you say, well, Ed, what are your credentials for talking? Well, these are my credentials. Paul didn't plant the church in Rome. The epistles to the Romans is the finest piece of wood for the furniture of the doctrine of the church. He didn't. But he says, I'm eager to go to Rome to confirm the gift that is already new. I didn't plant the church in Nanakuli. I didn't plant C4. But I'm here to confirm the gift that is in you. 
I'm here to tell you that you are destined for greatness, that you will do mighty things in the name of the Lord. And our intercessors are praying for now the Holy Spirit to pour down his oil on the wounds, on the pain, on the grief, which is real. We cannot dodge that. But God can use all things for good. Say it with me. God will use all things for good. So join me in a prayer now and say with me loud and clear, Father God. You are an almighty God. And in your great mercy, you have chosen me. You have chosen us to be your ambassadors. And we receive that charge. And we receive it with humility. And we thank you for the intercessors that are covering the heavenly places over Hawaii, creating a no-fly zone for demons, <laughs> for angels to move freely, <laughs> for principalities to come down. And now we pray, Lord, give us the anointing of Lydia, <laughs> who listened to Paul and acted on it. And we also pray, Lord, for those that are grieving and hurting. Oh, Lord, touch them today. Inject hope in them. We speak words of life and we release them all over Hawaii and particularly over Maui and Lahaina. And we declare that God will rebuild things. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Give a big hand to the Lord. Before you sit, tell somebody, today is a historic day. And look at them in the eye when you do it. I have been entrusted I have been entrusted with two sessions please have your seat have your seat this first session will begin with a prophetic act and then I will go into some teaching for you to realize oh what well, I already have it in me I need to turn it on you see I'm not here to impart an anointing for transformation. I'm here to activate that anointing for transformation. <clears throat> when the devil cannot stop you from hoping that God will change this lovely nation of Hawaii, he will tell you, yes, he might do it, but through Creighton, through Allen, through Cal, I'll help him. But uh, I don't think I can be as good as they are. And that lie, which appeals to excessive humility, keeps you back and makes them and us vulnerable. Because if you are one step ahead of the group, you are the leader. If the group takes four steps back, you become a target. And that's why we have to come together, you know, and what you heard me and you heard Allen and Carl and Creighton teach publicly. You will receive the anointing to teach to others who will teach others. And then at that moment, you have a movement sweeping Hawaii. But we have to come against a spirit of inferiority or inadequacy or who am I, right? Who are you? I mean, you have a saying here in Hawaii, we're going to pull it down. So you may have seen it before, but I'm going to play this one minute video clip. And I want you to answer the question, which one is the most important domino in that domino change reaction? Let's play it. <laughs> Everybody knows about playing with dominoes, 
But what you may not know is that a domino can knock over another domino, which is about one and a half times larger. So what I have here is a chain of dominoes. Each one is one and a half times larger than the previous one. And the smallest domino is about five millimeters high and one millimeter thick. And I will carefully place it. And there are 13 dominoes. And the largest domino, it weighs about 100 pounds and is more than a meter tall. Ready? Boom. That was 13 dominoes. If I had 29 dominoes, the last domino would be as tall as the Empire State Building. Let's see it in slow-mo. Which one is the most important domino? The smallest one, for two reasons. Number one, it started the chain reaction. But number two, he believed that something bigger than him is going to happen. And that's why we are here today. So what does it mean to be Christ-like? We say, well, it's to live a sinless life, it's to love others, and so forth. But I want to bring a dimension that is the catalyst for all of us to be Christ-like. Jesus says, read it with me, one, two, three. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than this he will do, because I go to the Father. Do you believe in Jesus? Yes. Well, he said you are certified to do the same works that Jesus did. And even greater works than him. So first you do the same works, and then you do greater works than him. We have no problem believing that the apostles did that. But I'm here to tell you that that's for you and me today. Let me speak foolishly, like Paul spoke in a couple of epistles, but you have to tell the Galatians and the Corinthians, you know, how, what a big shot he was. He said, listen, if you have anything to boast about, let me tell you, and I'll speak foolishly. And then he details, I mean, credentials, just to put them in their proper place that they needed to learn from Paul so that they could do greater works than Paul. I feel tremendously honored to be here. I mean, my wife and I have been praying and texting, and she said, honey, go for it, go for it. God will use you. But why am I here? By the grace of God, I have the privilege to lead a worldwide network in five continents with close to 29,000 influencers. They are changing cities. They are changing. We have two presidents in a network. We have first ladies that are intercessors. I mean, we have a, an up and coming future prime minister in a top nation. I mean, it's amazing what God is doing. Now, we have to differentiate between the woodpecker and the lightning, okay? Because when the woodpecker hit the tree and lightning struck, he felt, I didn't know I have all that power. No, no. He just happened to be in the right place at the right moment where God is struck. So I am that woodpecker, okay? I'm not delighted, but I need to tell you, I need to set up this for a prophetic act. I am a shy guy. You don't realize it because shy preachers and shy CEOs starve to death. So I learned to fake it. But... <laughs> But if I have a choice, give me my wife, give me my kids, give me a book, and I'm a happy camper. I have so much fun with myself, just thinking. <laughs> but God gave me things, I said, God, give it to people or else. And so I have to pretend that I'm Gregorius and I shake hands and I know your name and so forth, <laughs> you know. But 
But I remember the first time I have to witness, I thought I was praying for the rapture to happen in that moment. <laughs> but by the grace of God, I had the privilege to address the entire continent of Africa, 53 nations, 2,000 stadiums, 22 million people, okay? And from the pulpit, there were 70,000 people in the stadium. By the grace of God, I did it. By the grace of God, I addressed the largest church in the Philippines, 2 million 800,000 people. So by the grace of God, I have seen that grace. But I am here not to boast about that, but I'm here to tell you that if you do the same things that I did with the principles, you will do greater things than me. And we have to break that stronghold, you know, that the leader leads people, but those that he is leading are destined to be leaders and greater leaders than himself. And God spoke to me very clearly, and he told me, Ed, if you believe that everybody I put before you, for you to teach, if they do it, they will do it as good as you do and better than you. And I shall say, yes, Lord. No, no, I'm not done talking, he says. Never interrupt God. And when they do it better than you, you will rejoice. And God circumcised my heart. I have a million sins for which I need forgiveness every day. But jealousy is not one of them. I rejoice when people do things as good or better than me. And I love to cheer them up. So today, I'll be sharing principles. Then Alan will come and he will hit the ball outside of city limits. But you see, we need to break that stronghold that Ed can do it, Alan can do it, Creighton can do it. I'm here to tell you, you will do it. And so we're going to start the change reaction. And I want to invite Alan and Creighton to join me here for a moment. Would you come? And Carl, you are the broker of this because this is a guy that didn't believe he could be an apostle in Hawaii, but he got tricked by God, okay? <laughs> and, uh, and I want you to preside over this. Creighton and Alan, the Lord told me that today, I have to transfer to you everything that God has given me. I have to transfer to you so that you will not only do what I do, you will do it better than me and bigger than me. I mean, and bigger than me. So that when we come to an end, we will have a prophetic act and you will tell your people, you will do it better than me. Do you agree with that? So... Would you stand up, folks? And Father God, in your presence, you have been so gracious to Ruth and I. You have given us children that are mighty and sons in law that are awesome, and grandkids that are on fire, and a family of people that love and honor us worldwide. You have allowed me, Lord, time and again to see your power come down and change peoples and change even industries. And now, Father, in obedience, I lay hands on Creighton, I lay hands on Allen with Cal presiding. And I say, Creighton, Allen, everything God gave me, I pass it on to you. I pass it on to you. And you will go as far as I have gone first, and then you will go beyond that. And what you have heard me teach publicly, you will teach others who will teach others until the glory of the Lord, the knowledge of the glory of God will cover Hawaii, and Hawaii will be a light to the nations. Amen. Father, let your angels in heaven Amen. record in the book of memories that at this moment at 8.49 a.m., on this historic day in America, I have done this, and now they are your prisoners. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amén en amén. Amén, 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 amén. Ok, and I want you, Allen, to tell everybody under you, you will do my works and greater than me, and you create them. Can we have a microphone, please? Yeah. Are you ready to be prisoners? Okay. Would you follow Allen? Would you follow Creighton the way they follow Jesus? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Okay, you have the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. All right, for those of you from the west side and for those of you who are following through to Hawaii and west, the west side Ecclesia, Father, we just pray, Lord God, the same blessing that uh, Crete and I receive, we pray for it. A double portion of blessings, Lord God, that they will go above and beyond their wildest expectation. And Mari and I will celebrate and rejoice, Lord God, as they go forth to do greater things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs> You know, one of the biggest things for me this year has been being a part of Alan's Ecclesia. It's absolutely incredible and changed my life. I would recommend everybody jump into <laughs> Alan's Ecclesia. Um, the, the Lord highlighted just um, honoring um, what this man has done. Um, he looks strong and everything, but the Lord has showed me his heart of repentance Amen. that has brought unity within the body and unity in the community. Um, he has a heart of long-standing persistence and consistency, just serving in the snack shop. That's and nice. um, for 20, 20, over 20 years, hot dogs, you know, dollar, potato chips. I mean, just simple things that has changed the community. So just his long-standing obedience and that, the Lord has showed that as, as I honor him, that there's this pool of fresh water that he's created in Nanakuli that people are just drinking of because they've been drinking dirty water. He's offering fresh water that is bringing light. And that as we come along just as, and he's paid a huge price as a first mover. And we're like a fast follower. And it's almost, I'm sorry, Gomenasai, it all seems unfair. Mm. <laughs> but as the Lord has showed me like that to follow him, that he's going to create a well of fresh Amen. water in Amen. East Honolulu. Amen. And that as we come and honor and celebrate, that there'll be fresh water in East Honolulu. And get this, and it'll encourage you folks all to also start to create wells of fresh water, not copy-paste, not copy-paste, but just believing that all Amen. things are possible Amen. with God. Amen. And that as there's fresh waters that you create in your families, in your particular assignment, not despising the small things of the Lord, that you'll begin to connect Amen. these pools Amen. of fresh water. Amen. And it's going to blow yeah. your mind yeah. Yeah. in terms of... Yeah bringing revival to Hawaii Amen. and really allowing us, as Ed has says, to be a lighthouse to the Amen. nation. Amen. So I just want to be able to encourage you, Lord, we honor yeah. Nanai, Nanai Kapono, Alan, his team's obedience, their persistency, their consistency. Lord, and as we honor that, Lord, that there will be a move of God in East Honolulu, and it will encourage others, Lord, to begin to walk in greater ways, mm. in bigger ways. Amen. Not by their own power, not by their own might, but by your spirit. You Amen. will multiply what has happened mm. in Nanakuli to bring revival in this land and throughout the world. So, Lord, we receive that promise Amen. and that power. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. And Creighton, you're guilty of excessive humility. God has raised you as a mighty, powerful man. I want you to tell every UNC4, you will be as good and better than me. Could you tell them that? I receive that. <laughs> that I will be as good and better than Ed Savoso. Amen. But you will like your people to be as good and better than you. 
Yes. And I, I would need to hear that. Great. Yes. And my assignment is as a dream releaser. I will lay the foundation Amen. for my people to Amen. fly Good. beyond. Amen. My... <laughs> Good. Great job. Great job. Okay. Yeah. Wait. Test one. I got this word here. Now, I, I, this is the time. I heard this word this morning. It was from bus up to bus out. Yes. From bus up to bus out. And that this is what, he's, what Ed is talking about. Is some of us, you, you might feel bus up emotionally or physically or even spiritually. So you're going, ah, no way I can, no way. What are they talking about? No way. That's being bus up. But the Lord wants to bus you out today. Remember that song we sang about there's a lion inside of me, right? Didn't we sing that? Is there a lion inside of you? Is the lion of Judah inside of you, right? Today, today, he like busts out out of you. From bus up to bus out. This is, this is the day. This is it. But you got to grab hold. Amen. You got to grab hold. You cannot just sit back and go, okay, if... If can, can. If no, can, no, can. No, 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 no. You got to grab them. The Greek word is lambano. And, uh, and he says, as many as receive him, it's you got to grab hold of the Lord. Amen. Amen. You got to grab hold of Amen. this one. Okay, you cannot just go, okay, I sit back and if happen, happen. No. No. The Lord loves those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Amen. Right? Right? Amen. So everything today, you grab hold of him. You lambano that baby. Amen. All right? Will you, re- will you grab a hold of it? Yeah. Amen. Let's Amen. bust out today. Amen. Amen. Tell the one next to you, you are great and mighty, and take your seat. Now, I'll tell you, please have your seat. I already like uh, Creighton before, but I like him now even more because there is true humility in him. But don't miss this point. God uses people that have received an anointing for humility. So the devil will not tempt you with pride because pride doesn't appeal to humble people. But he will tempt you, and this is what I'm warning you against, with excessive humility. You see, pride overshoots, excessive humility undershoots. And, and God has given you a position, a place, you know. And if you're a leader and you choose to be humble like Jesus, you are a better leader. I have to learn this lesson the hard time. My spiritual father was Dr. C. Peter Wagner. He mentored me. He coached me. And in Argentina, I was able to accomplish an incredible thing with Peter Wagner there. But I thought it's because of Peter, not because of me. And Peter says, Ed, it's not because of me. It's because of you. And then he sends reluctance in me and says, why are you pulling back? Are you afraid of pride? Yes, that's what I'm afraid of. Don't worry. The Bible says if you humble yourself, he will exalt you. Yes, yes, I know that. But then he has some insurance. If you exalt yourself, he will humble you. (laughs) So don't embarrass God. When God puts a spotlight on you, you roll like a lion. You are not the best. You are the anointed one. You don't have all the money. You don't have all the people. You don't have all the training. And that's why when God put the spotlight on me, I want my daddy to be proud. I want to be that puppy dog chasing an 18 wheeler, believing that if I sink my teeth in the rear tire, God will make that truck stop. And God tells his angel, look at Ed, because he believes it, I will do it. So receive it, okay? And guard against excessive humility. I want to share with you a pivotal moment in my own journey, and I don't mean by any stretch of the imagination that I arrive. I'm on a journey. I may be a step or two ahead of you, but I have to keep going. 
And by the way, somebody could bring me a cup of chamomile tea. I, I run on anointing and chamomile tea, so I have the anointing. <laughs> Look at Paul. I mean, when Paul was just a little tiny guy, he said, I consider myself not in the least inferior to the most eminent apostles. The guy was very cocky, right? Uh, so he goes to Jerusalem, and they split. Peter goes to the circumcision, Paul to the uncircumcision, and he brags about a split. He had the calling, he had the anointed, but he didn't have the record. That is normal for your beginning in the apostolic journey. Your passion exceeds your reason. But about 16 years later, by then he had run around Jericho for a couple of times. He says, I am the least of the apostles. His ministry grew, his self me shrunk. Later on, he says, to me, I'm the least of the saints. And in the last letter that he wrote, he says, I am the worst of sinners. And folks, this is my aspiration, that as the ministry that God entrusted Ruth and I and others to build grows, I will realize that he's mighty. And I am just the donkey that is carrying Jesus. Maybe not even the donkey, maybe a flea in the neck of the donkey, but no ordinary flea because I'm the flea in the neck of the donkey that is carrying Jesus. And that's my prayer for you. Listen to the Holy Spirit. But God says, grab it. Don't try to understand it. Enjoy it. You don't practice for your honeymoon. You enjoy it, right? I mean, you don't practice for marriage. I mean, unless you're a serial divorcee, you enjoy it. So you don't have to understand it. You receive it. Amen? But God will never entrust us what we don't love. You see, if you don't love the lost sheep, and you love barbecue lamb, God will not entrust you with a lost sheep. Because when you find it, you will barbecue it. So we have to love Hawaii. We have to love the world. And recently, the Lord spoke to me and says, Ed, you have to be reconciled to me. And I said, Lord, I am reconciled by the blood of Jesus. No, no, I'm talking about a deeper level of reconciliation. And then he took me to this passage in 2 Corinthians, where Paul is saying, I plead with you, be reconciled to God. And then he says, Paul did not write to unbelievers, he wrote to all goats. I mean, the Corinthians have been believers for about 20 years, and he's telling them, you are not reconciled with God, and you have received the grace of God in vain. Why? Because you don't love the world. And then he took me to verse 17. If you are in Christ, you are a new creature. You know that verse. All things are past. Past sins, present sins, even future sins, they are forgiven. I can take a bath there and feel good, and I can stand before God as if I have never sinned because I have been reconciled, right? But God says, look a couple of verses down. Who, who was in Christ also? God. And what did he bring into Christ? The world. And what did he do for the world, okay? He reconciled the world. He didn't hold his trespasses against it. And then the Lord reminded me, you received Christ on November 15, 1958. Remember? Oh, yes, Lord, I remember. Well, that was not the day that Jesus died on the cross. That was the day that you found out that you have been reconciled by Jesus. And then at that moment, he says, Ed, the world has already been redeemed, but it doesn't know that it has been redeemed. The political parties have been redeemed. The marketplace has been redeemed. The school system has been redeemed. The chamber of commerce has been redeemed. 
And if you treated as an enemy, you're not like Christ. She walks into Jericho, and the most unpopular guy is a tax collector, a traitor to the nation of Israel. And Jesus honors Zacchaeus by going to his house. He stops by a well, and a woman who is a serial adulteress, he honors her. Hey, you have something that I need. You see, he loved them the way they are so that they can become the way they ought to become. And then he took me to verse 6, to chapter 6, verse 2. I plead with you, or else you will receive the grace of God in vain. What does it mean to receive the grace of God? For somebody who is more Calvinist than Armenian, that is a challenge. I mean, grace is irresistible. He said, you are the Dead Sea and not the Sea of Galilee. If you have been to the Holy Land, you can smell the death of the Dead Sea miles away because it takes water and it never releases water. But the Sea of Galilee is full of fish and flora and fauna because it takes water from the north and it gives water from the south. And then the Lord says, Ed. And I said, Lord, I'm almost there. Just be patient with me. And then he gave me a word picture. He says, imagine you're in love with a girl and you love her passionately, but she hates you. You send her flowers, she tramps on them. You write a letter, she spits on it and leaves it back to you. You blow her a kiss and she sticks her tongue. But you love her with agape love. And eventually, I mean, you keep loving her. And then one day, you rescue her from death. And now she looks at you differently. And she falls in love with you. And you hug and you kiss and you have a romantic, idyllic courtship. And you get married and your honeymoon is better than anything you have seen in Hollywood. And you come from the honeymoon and every day is an extension of the honeymoon. And then she gets pregnant. And the day the baby is delivered, she stops loving you and transfers all her love to the baby. How would you feel? I said, Lord, I will be devastated. That what my pastor have done to me. I loved the world before there was a church. I gave them a church. And they loved the church, but they don't love the world. They have received my grace in vain. They use it for self-gratification. And then he pointed, it, it don't. Hear me wrongly. I believe in worship. I believe in music. I'm married to a musical woman. We have a music room in our house. Our grandkids are musicians, some of them. They said, look at the lyrics. You and I, I and you, the two of us, is in this queue. And one mile around that building, there's human trafficking, there's poverty, there's misery, there's depression. So he said, Lord, how can I love a political party that is evil. How can I love people in government that are legislating iniquity? How can I love them? And then he took me to verse 6. And he said, actually, to verse 16. From now on, you know no one in the flesh, but you know them in Christ. So you can look at that corrupt person the way God, Jesus, looked at Zacchaeus. And he saw him in Christ. You can look at the company you work for, but there's a lot of hanky-panky. And you say, they don't know it. But in Christ, they have been forgiven. And at that moment, you become like Christ. John 1.25 says, And we beheld his glory, glory as the only begotten of the Father. There is no higher rank than that. I mean, the only begotten of the Father, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. And how does the verse follow? Full of grace, say grace. grace. And full of truth, say truth. First grace, then truth. The devil reversed that. And now we preach the truth. Repent. And you will go to hell. And if you repent, God will give you grace. 
And that is not being Christ-like. Being Christ-like is loving them the way they are. It's prayer evangelism, it bless that blast, you know? It's loving the wolves that are trying to have you for breakfast. So I want you to receive this now, receive an impartation, because God will put you in front of very influential people in Hawaii and beyond, in front of them. And they need to feel the love that you love them the way they are. You love them the way Jesus loved the men that brought the adulterous woman to him. We think he loved the adulterous woman. He loved the men too. I want you to receive this. And if you want to receive it, raise your hand and say, I receive it. I receive it. I receive it. I don't understand it, but I receive it. And look how it goes. Now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation because you will be a worthy ambassador of Christ. You will go as a peacemaker and not as a troublemaker. And that's why we need to see that. I learned this lesson kind of a hard way. And those of you that have read my books or done the accelerator, you know that we began in Resistencia, a city of 400,000 people with only 5,143 believers, 70 churches, 68 of which were the result of a split. Bringing pastors together was like organizing a porcupine dance. No one wanted to get close to the other one. They loved to hate each other. But seven pastors came together. And they said, okay, we don't know how, but we know what. And they began to pray. Because the pastor, we say in Spanish, can be la clave o el clave. Can be the key that turns the engine, or can be the nail that punctures the tires, you know? So they wanted to be the key. And so one thing led to the other, if you read the book. But there was a leader, he was not even a pastor, who the pastor didn't like because he hung around politicians. And politicians are dirty people. But I have discernment by the grace of God. I said, he has something. So I said to this guy, Tito, Tito, don't tell the pastors. We're going to go and visit the mayor. I have never met a mayor, I mean, since I became a Christian. My father was a politician. I dealt with a lot of politicians growing up, but never since I became a believer. So we go to see the mayor. He was a tall guy, a colonel in the army, macho of machos. And he told me about the city without water, the city that has no water in summer and is flooded in winter, and the slum areas are... And he speaks with a passion. And God says, Ed, you love the church, but he loves the city. He has my ear. He loves the city. What a shock. And then out of faith, I said, sir, we would like to build water tanks all over the place. And we will bring equipment to redirect the flow of the water. I didn't have the money, but it doesn't matter if you're a visionary. A visionary manages schizophrenia every day. <laughs> it can be done, but it will be done. It can be done, but it will be done. And so I made the vow, and then uh, you read the story, we completed. But as I left, I said, may I pray for you? I have never prayed for a mayor. Today, everybody prays for them. I'm talking 35 years ago, that was borderline heresy. I pray for him, and his eyes well up with tears. Argentines make Texans look like sissies. We are a macho, macho country. I mean, if you're a colonel in the army, and you, you don't show weakness, okay? But this guy, something touched him. So as not to embarrass him, we shook hands, and I said goodbye. The pastor found out, oh my goodness, I have the council of Jerusalem on my tail. They wanted to know, what have you been doing in Cornelius' house? I mean, paraphrase in the book of Acts. So they organized a barbecue. That's the beauty of Argentines. Before they kill you, they feed you, you know? <laughs> and so they organized a barbecue. And we are there dealing down. See, nobody told me what they were planning to do, but I have this sermon. I knew that 
I was going to face a fighting squad. And who pulls up? The mayor. Where does an 800-pound gorilla sit? Anywhere he wants. <laughs> because if he had sorry, your pleasure would say here. So everybody came to go, Mr. Mayor, what an honor, what a pleasure to have you here. And then the mayor says, I came to see Ed Silvoso. And then he looked at me in the eye and said, what you gave me yesterday was so sublime. Would you give me another shot? <laughs> now, I am not a charismatic guy, you know, the lay hands, people fall, they roll, they bounce against the walls. I appreciate, I admire people that have that. I don't have that one. But when I pray for him, and the pastors are mesmerized, we get the mayor, Ed is going to pray for him. The guy is slain in the spirit. And the pastor, oh, this is of God. We have to work for them. <laughs> you see, I learned a lesson there. I don't have time to tell you more stories. But I want you to receive this. You should never manage the anointing. All you can do is ride the anointing. Today you got imparted by your leaders that you will do the same works that Creighton and Allen and Francis Oda and Carl and many others you will be hearing. Don't try to find out how. Just get in the river. Be flood sand in God's river. And this is our assignment. And you have heard this before. In the book of Ephesians, Paul says that there were terrible divisions between Jews and Gentiles. They hated each other. He said, we are here to bridge the gap. There were divisions among the saints, people that follow James, people that follow Paul. He said, we are here to bridge the gap. There were divisions among the ministries, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, each one doing their thing. Paul says, we must be diligent in maintaining Say maintaining, not creating, maintaining the unity in the bond of peace. We are already united. Don't believe that we are divided. We have to rediscover unity between husbands and wives, unity between parents and children, unity between master and slaves. Look at that. Project that over Hawaii. Okay, the ethnic divisions, okay, the denomination passive aggressive divisions. I mean, the competition between apostles and prophets and so forth. I mean, I'm sure you are no exception. This is true all over the world. Marriages that are destroyed or they stay together, but they die a long time ago. And this is your assignment. This is our assignment. Today, the East and the West come together to bridge that gap. But look at the screen. For you have done that, then and only then, you engage the forces of wickedness in the heavenly places over Hawaii. Because if you don't have your base cover, you're very vulnerable. You're going to do a prophetic act. My heart goes out to my prophet friends. They are all the time binding and loosing and this and that. And a month later, it's a mess. Churches divided, immorality exposed. Why? Because you have to protect your base. And you are that base. Your leader has invited to come here. Your leaders are telling you, we are going to work together. We're going to build this. We're going to bring healing. When you listen to Alan, in a few minutes, you will see how these gaps are being breached. This is not, I mean, when I was here, how long ago, 25 years ago, I was teaching the theory. I was pushing the domino, but the domino already hit the tipping point. And now the domino is leaving us. Oh, receive this. What God is doing in Hawaii is extraordinary, extraordinary. And that to whom that much has been given, much will be demanded, okay? But look at that. Of all those gaps, it's the home. It's the home. The light that shines the farthest is the one that shines the brightest at the base. And that's why in T.O.W., the driver is the family. And within the family, the engine is the couple. 
And within the couple, the fuel is romance. And that's why I encourage you, you know, get my wife book. There is one left there, you know, and you will see how real this is. So dream with me now that Hawaii will be a place of happy homes. Hawaii will be a place of open heavens that every Japanese wedding that is celebrated here will go back with the anointing of the ecclesia. You dream about that. I mean, you have the beauty, you have everything. We have to go there, cousins and wives. Okay, I'm rushing a little bit because I don't want to take any time away. But how do we go there? And some of these things are happening already. Yes, they are. But they haven't changed a city yet. They haven't changed an industry yet. Why? Because you need banks to the river. What is the difference between a swamp or a lake and a river? And I use the term not the way Donald Trump used it, you know, to put down Washington, D.C., Swamps are an integral part of our uh, ecological balance. They have life, they have flora, they have fauna. That's why the federal government, and I'm sure Francis knows this because he's building cities, you have to go through a lot of navigation, you know, because you don't want to dry up swamps. But the problem is that swamps have life, but it doesn't flow. You have to go to the swamp, you have to go to the lake, to catch what is there. Lakes that are a little bit better than swamps, uh, aesthetically, they don't have streams. They don't have currents. The lake is there. The river flows with life, and it comes to you. And that's what is going to happen today, I pray fervently. I'm just the obstetrician. It's your baby, it's your womb, okay? That today you will come together And out of East and West, being united in Christ, out of those that have and those that have not, but have things that they have, don't have, river will begin to flow. And I will elaborate. So how do you turn a swamp into a river? You put banks. And you connect it to a higher source of water. The water begins to flow. It hits the banks. And rather than going all over, begins to go in the direction of the incline of the terrain, breaks the contour, becomes a trickle, stream, a creek, and a river. So that's why these five paradigms are pivotal. Without these, the plane will not fly. Number one, you are called to disciple nations. Say, I'm called to disciple Hawaii. Say it. Because Jesus says, go and disciple nations. So it's not just people, it's nations. The marketplace, which is the heart of Hawaii, has been redeemed. God took Hawaii into Christ and told Hawaii, you are forgiven. And that's why Hawaii is eagerly awaiting the manifestation of the children of God to tell them, you are forgiven. Only twice the expression, the sons of God, is used in the New Testament. And it says that the entire creation is eagerly awaiting the manifestation of the sons of God. And then it says that blessed are the peacemakers because they shall be called sons of God. You have to go to your company, to your school, to your police station, to whatever you are, and be a peacemaker, not a troublemaker. Okay? And then it takes us to this. Every Christian is a minister and labor is worship. Imagine a taxi driver now driving a taxi unto the glory of God with the manifest presence of Jesus all over the taxi. We have case study after case study. Imagine a waitress actually in Dallas last week. We anointed a waitress, came to the Lord, her knees were hurting. Rather than praying just for the food, we pray for her knees. God healed her. The next morning, she gave testimony. Right there, Ruth and I commissioned her. You are the pastor of this restaurant. What do I do? Well, when you come in the morning, invite Jesus to come in. And when you bring food to the table, don't tell the customer, but bless the food. 
and then watch them. They will be blessed and your tips will go up. Like the beer, okay? Because if every believer in Hawaii realizes I am a minister, I am an expression of the church, and my job is worship. Watch at the Google map of Hawaii. Millions of acts of worship going up every day. It's not complicated, okay? Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. And we are to take the kingdom of God to where the kingdom of darkness is, for Jesus to build his church there. Look at this one. Read it with me. One, two, three. Upon this rock, Now, look at word association. Say gates. Yes. Say keys. Yes. Okay. Satan has gates, but he no longer has the keys. Jesus said, I'm Alpha and Omega. I was dead and I'm alive. And what do I have in my hands? The keys of Hades and death. And I believe that he changed the name to the keys of the kingdom. And so whatever the devil has on Hawaii, he cannot add any more. You have the keys to lock and to unlock, to eliminate systemic poverty, social injustice. Uh, Bishop Ron McLaughlin, an African-American, told me, if Jesus were to send a text message to the church, will be a three-word text message. Go to hell. <laughs> Theologically speaking, because it says there, you know, we must go where the gates of Hades are. Don't be afraid. Don't be intimidated by the size of the corruption, of the apathy, of the selfishness. In a contest between a huge gate and a tiny key, who wins? The key. You have the keys. You are receiving the anointing to use it. A year from now, we will be celebrating all over Hawaii, extraordinary, beyond what Nanakuli is showing us. And then he says, nation transformation must be tangible, has to be measurable, with the premier social indicator being the elimination of systemic poverty. We have to eliminate systemic poverty. And that's what we are after. Not only material poverty, which is the byproduct of lack of motivation, lack of relationships, and so forth. So, to bring it to a place, look at now. You have one bank, the other bank, you know it better than me. It's bless and not blast. Fellowship and don't run away. Okay, minister, don't judge. And proclaim the kingdom of God has come. And this is the only part in the four gospel that Jesus taught a method. And six chapters later, we read that everyone was forcing their way into it. Let the Lord speak to you. There will be hundreds of thousands of Hawaiians forcing their way, not into a church building, into the kingdom of God. And the church building will be the lungs that will infuse doctrine and fellowship and teaching and, and relief. But the church will happen in the city. So, where do we go from here? How do you turn a business into an ecclesia? How do you turn a school into an ecclesia? How do you turn a traditional church and praise God for traditional churches? None of us will be here if we were not for a local church, for the pastors that are here. So I want to suggest eight bridges and apply them to your business, not just to the church. We must preach not just personal salvation, household salvation. That waitress, I led her to the Lord, but then she led the restaurant to the Lord. She invited the Lord to come in. That's what Zacchaeus happened. I mean, why will the greedy guy give away money? Because salvation came to his 
house to his or Hannah. Okay? Number two, from pastoring believers or employees that are believers to shepherding the city. You know, in that video about the ecclesia, I teach that apostles originally were admirals in charge of a fleet. Pastors, business people, you have a lot of ships. Don't have them tied up to the deck. Release them to do that in the city. Number three, from preaching with words to proclaiming with deeds. Never preach anything you don't believe that God is going to honor. I want you to receive this, receive this. Not just Allen, not just Carl, Creighton, Francis. You receive it. You will receive the anointing. God will reveal to you what is already bound in heaven. And you will proclaim it on earth and people will be healed. Not everybody gets healed. But those that we pray for, that we saw in the spirit, that will be healed, are healed. So we have to go beyond words. Number three, from saving souls to discipling nations. There is a movement about a billion souls. And I say, amen, qualifier. I don't want a billion souls. I want a billion people saved. Because soul is about going to heaven. People is about bringing heaven down to earth. From contemplating God, worshiping, which is important, to partnering with God. Write this down. Without God, you can't. Without you, he won't do it. So important. And from water baptism to Holy Spirit baptism. Don't just lead people to the Lord, which is extraordinary. The moment you lead them to the Lord, you lay hands on them to be filled with the Holy Spirit. In my book, Ecclesia, I demonstrate that every time people were baptized in water, they were baptized by the Spirit before or after. There's only one exception, and I believe God allowed it because it required correction. We were doing this in Africa before I understood the Ecclesia. Uh, I could articulate it as well as I do today. I have two businessmen with me. And they loved to lead people to the Lord. They were exhibit A, like Alan Cardenas, for Luke 10. They were leading names and waiters and managers. And I said, listen, if you're going to be true to the scriptures, it's not enough for them to receive the Lord. They say, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And that baptism cannot be just water baptism. It has to be baptism with power, to heal the sick, to cast out demons, to overcome poison. So I said, listen, we are in the middle of Africa. No one knows we are here. There are no television cameras. Let's try it. I said, everybody you lead to the Lord, we're going to baptize them in the hotel. So they led a number of people, and they led the manager of the hotel. And then they said, could we use a swimming pool? So that night, we used a swimming pool. We baptized the people. We lay hands on them, be filled with the Holy Spirit, go home. If there's somebody sick, heal them. If there are demons, how do I know? Well, you know, any feeling that is negative, you say, the name of Jesus, get out. And we send them out. You say, but Ed, what about training, discipleship? Let me remind you that God commissioned Paul three days after he got saved. There was no training, okay? So we did that. The next morning... I'm still with jet lag, so I'm trying to get my bearings. And this tall guy says, Pastor, I was baptized last night. Oh, that's so cool. And I went home, and my mother was sick. I lay here, she got healed. And I have a witch doctor, and I rebuke, and it broken. Wow. It works. <laughs> so the following morning, I was still in jet lag. I'm trying to navigate the lobby of the hotel to the car that will take me. And I'm crying for power, for anointing. And I get ambushed by a bunch of black ladies, Africa. And they begin to lay hands and pray over me and rebuke. And but boy, when they were done, I could have charged hell with a water gun, you know? <laughs> and I said to the driver, who was one of these two guys, 
I don't see intercession. Oh, no, no. Those are the maids that we baptized last night. <laughs> I want you to receive these. When they are still fresh, when they still smell like sinners, that's the moment to get the anointing because they attract other sinners and they create a change reaction. I'm running slightly over time, but uh, I need to make the point if I may. We have to switch from going to church or going to a business that is a Christian business to be in the ecclesia 24-7. 24-7. I, I see some of you taking notes with your iPhone. I wish when I was in college I could have done that. <laughs> But I want you to do all my PowerPoints. I'll gladly send them to you within two days. Just leave an email or a WhatsApp number at the book table. Okay? Now, in conclusion, what is the key? And I close with this. You are the Iglesia. Say, I am the Iglesia. And you're going to demonstrate. Oh, wait. Let's go back. <laughs> you're going to demonstrate all over Hawaii. That when you go to a place, you take the present. But where do you begin? At home. At home. At home. So let's watch this video clip, and then I'll have a prayer, and I will introduce Ali. Please, go for it. Hello, my friend. I have very good news. There is no question that we are living in an evil day. What to do when an evil day is upon us? Well, the Word of God tells us what to do. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. To be strong in the Lord is to know who we are. We are his church. We are his ecclesia. Greater is he who is in us than the one who is in the world. And this is where the good news comes. Jesus introduced the church, the ecclesia, in Matthew 16. And he said, I will build my church, my ecclesia, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. When he said, I will build my church, he said, I will build you, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against you. So what should we do? Number one. Realize that you are the church. You are the ecclesia. Because ecclesia literally means assembly. Every assembly needs a quorum. And the Lord established a very low quorum. Two people gathering his name. I'll be in their midst. Number two, dedicate your home as a temple for that church, for that ecclesia, where the presence of Jesus lives 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Ruth, my wife, and I did that. We took Revelation 3.20 literally. There Jesus says, I'm standing at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I will have fellowship with them. Jesus is not talking there about the door of the human heart. He's talking about a building that Christian went in and they never invited him. So Ruth and I did that. We opened the door of our home. We welcomed Jesus. We enthroned him. And now we have breakfast with Jesus, lunch with Jesus, tea time with Jesus, dinner with Jesus. His presence is all over the place and is so powerful that the strangers that come feel it. And we have seen several people that have no church background come to the Lord because they felt something when they came to our house. And now number three, adopt your neighbors in prayer. Practice Luke 10. In Luke 10, we learn four principles that Jesus taught. Number one, bless them. Speak peace over the people that don't know the Lord. Number two, fellowship with them. Eat and drink with them. And that allows you to bless them close range. Number three, minister to them. If they have a need, take care of them. And number four, proclaim. The 70 did that. And they came back blown away. 
the demons were subject to them. And Jesus said, yes, and even Satan fell down. And this is the good news. We can push back the darkness when everyone, every day, everywhere, realizes that they are the Ecclesia. When we do that, we begin to see Luke 10 all over again. So my friend, let's go for it. This is the moment when the church has to get out of the closet. Wherever we go, we must take the power and the presence of Jesus. So to summarize it, you are the Ecclesia, connect with someone else, invite the presence of Jesus. Number two, dedicate your home. Why your home? Because that's where we live. The light that shines the farthest is the one that shines the brightest at the base. Later on, you will dedicate the workplace, the school, but begin with the home. And number three, adopt your neighbors. Pray and walk your neighborhood. Speak peace over people. As God opens the door, fellowship with them. Minister to them. And finally, proclaim the kingdom of God has come. Yes, last be the ecclesia. Everyone, every day, everywhere. Go to the website or to our Facebook, Ecclesia Everywhere, and register. Join millions of people all over the world, That's and we problem. will see the spiritual climate change. We will see multitudes come to the Lord. And you know what? And the Lord will return in glory. Let's go for it. Yeah. Stand up and uh, I know you're looking at me and say, hey, this is a lot. It is, it is. But the spirit that is in you will appropriate it for you. So just let's pray the prayer that Creighton prayed. Let's be that boy that took everything he had and gave it to Jesus. Would you lift up your hands and pray with me? Dear Lord, Give me, give us the leper's anointing, the desire to go someplace else for you to surprise us that you have already visited that place. We receive it by faith. We will apply it by faith. And we pledge to you, Lord, Lord, everything we are, everything we we have, have, we surrender it to you. you. In Jesus' name. name. Amen. Amen. Would you welcome Alan (laughs) Corbin? All right, Aloha. You guys may be seated. Thank you so much. Um, this is my beautiful wife, Mari, God's secret weapon. And just want to share something before I start sharing what God is doing on our side. Okay. We just wanted to extend our mahalo to Pastor Creighton and Sister D for opening up your home and inviting us and just truly blessing us with genuine hospitality. On behalf of the West Side, we say mahalo. Yeah, thank you, Pastor Creighton. Thank you. And um, Pastor Creighton has just uh, have been an instrument of healing for us on the West Side with his humility and his heart to serve. So it's really a blessing to be here. I got here this morning. We got here early. I got out of my car and I turned around and I looked. I knew C4 was on the east side of the island and I knew I was going to come to the east side. But I, had, I, I, I did not know exactly where on the east side was C4. See, back in the day before this was a church, this was a bar. And I was working in construction over 20 years ago. We were working at a house on, on, on this side of the island. And afterward, we would often come here and close the bar. And this one specific night, uh, me and the crew were drinking B-52s and chasing it with Long Island iced teas all night long. I drank enough B-52s to win the next World War III. World War III. Uh, anyways, beknownst to us, uh, my boss and I, um, the police was sitting uh, outside in a parking lot. Uh, our eyes were so twisted, we didn't see them. We jumped in a car, and then they followed us to the stoplight right across the street. They pulled us over, and they, they, asked, they, they asked my boss 
to walk the line. And he said in his own colorful language back then, I'll snort the line, not walk the line. And he pushed him out of the car. I'm an innocent bystander. I got shoved against a thing. And, and, and we went to a, 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 a jail that night. Uh, they posted bail. And we got out in the nick of time to do a concrete pour back over here on this side of the island. And we came right back here to close the bargain the next night. But I, I, that night when we got arrested, I was crying because I was getting arrested by HPD. But today I'm coming back here and crying because I've been arrested by Jesus to come back and shift the spiritual climate. So I just want to start off sharing this morning that God is doing a new thing. Turn to somebody next to you and say, God's doing a new thing. I want to open up with this question again. Is it biblical and possible for one person to believe that God can shift the spiritual climate here and now? We believe that in the Bible, in the Old Testament, the New Testament. But do you believe it in the U Testament? Turn to somebody next to you. Tell them you're the U Testament. Yeah, because you are the one that God's writing right now to be able to shift this climate. I want to uh, pose a question that Ed, Ed uh, Savoso had asked 20 years ago. If you died, your church would cry and miss you. And this is for the pastors and the leaders. How many pastors and leaders we got here today? Raise your hands. If you died, your church would cry and miss you. But would your community cry and miss you? Would they know, even know that you're gone? And that rocked me. And that rocked me. And, and I thought about Matthew 6.21 where Jesus says, Where your treasure is, your heart will be also. And oftentimes, it's easy for our hearts to be so in the church that all we see is treasures in the church. I'm, I'm just talking about me. And we don't realize that God's pouring out His Spirit upon all people. Upon all people. Not just in the church, but also in the city. And, and for the last 20 years, uh, I've been applying this teaching from Ed to be able to live it out, to look at the treasures in the city. And by special request, we are here because Pastor Creighton had asked for us. But he specifically asked for Mana and Ivalani and Jody and some of the people. So I brought some of the treasures here so that you will see that our God is an awesome God. I want to share with you District 8. Uh, we were focused on the city in Nanakuli 20 years ago. We expanded our territory to District 8. Honolulu Police Department, this District 8 is from Kaena Point uh, all the way to... Uh, all the way to Eva Beach. And it encompasses about 50,000 uh, homes or 150,000 people. On any given time, there's about 18 officers. Uh, again, on a good day, 18 officers patrolling. Uh, and do the math, that's a ratio of about one police officer to almost two, over 2,000 homes. Or one police officer for 8,000 people. Can you imagine being a pastor of a church that large? Think about it. Can you be, imagine being a pastor of a church that large? The thing is this, that model is not working, and it's not a fault of our own for our police officers. But that model is not working to shift the spiritual climate. More police officers will not work. Then what will? Then what will it take? And again, I'm working with um, current police officers, retired police officers, special agents, and so forth, to be able to look at, is it biblical and possible to change the spiritual climate of the city based on the five paradigms and Luke chapter 10. I'd like to humbly submit to you, it is possible. we got a video we're going to pull up right now. I want to share with you a, a video of what ordinary people are doing to do extraordinary things in such a way that you will believe that God can and will use you as the U Testament. <laughs> to be able to shift the spiritual climate. So do we have that, that video? All right, Nanakuli check out this awesome video. Oahu was a place known as one of the poorest communities in Hawaii. Many native Hawaiians live in Nanakuli. The crime rate at one time was almost 5% higher than the national average. Poverty is a major contributor to crime, but another major factor is adverse childhood experience, which then you compound with the disintegration of the family unit, fused with drugs and alcohol, then the outcome for domestic and gang violence, homelessness, and suicide exponentially rises. But in the last few years, 
something has changed. Something wonderful has happened. Could this little community in Hawaii have the answer for the problems of the world? This is the transformation of Nanakuli. Aloha, my name is Pastor Alan Cardenas Jr. from Nanakuli. Our Neighborhood Security Watch partnered with the Honolulu Police Department to pull off Operation Blue Light Christmas. The goal of that is to bring a positive unity in community to be able to come together in positive circumstances. The wonderful miracle was that our police officers were able to distribute over 1,000 free gifts to the children in our community. And it was unbelievable because people are so used to the police being the bad guys, have to take people to jail. But our community was able to see them in a powerful light. There's so many testimonies that are happening, but the spirit of aloha, the spirit of Christmas is alive and well in Nanakuli. But not just Nanakuli, it's spreading to Kahalu. Amen, man, Pastor Allen. Hey, aloha. I'm Kelly Boy Dilima. My wife, Leo Lani, here. Uh, and you know, we took that, that vision that Pastor Allen had and uh, we took it to our own community. You know, if you're not doing nothing to make a difference in, in your community, it's your fault. And we did our own Kahalu'u Blue Light Christmas. And it was such a success, Pastor <laughs> Allen. The kids were so blessed. We played music for them. It was beautiful, you know, and there's a saying, yeah, it's better to give than to receive. And, you know, when I was younger, I didn't really understand that saying. But now that we're here, the church is here, it really is better to give than to receive. The, the givers were so blessed. And just the fulfillment of this purpose and this vision for our community. It's the birth of a Yesu culture, a culture of kindness, a culture of lokahi and laulima, a culture of olu olu or ohana, a culture of ha'a ha'a. Really, it's, it's God pulling humility and civility back in humanity. But yeah, he's a big deal, this guy, Pastor Allen. I don't see stuff I used to see 10 years ago. You know, as far as crime and a lot of drug abuse, that kind of went clear out. You know, new people coming in with new ideas. So we gotta do, we gotta bring on change to the community. Start with the young people, you know, motivate them. Uh, showing the kids that we're their friends, you know, like something uh, other than coming to uh, arrest people and give tickets and all that negativity. Yeah, so yeah, we're, we're gonna hand out the presents and uh, make a connection with the kids so that they know we're there for them as well. It helped us a lot with our attitude as well. I mean, it's Pastor Allen's given us a fire that we really needed and we haven't had in a while because, you know, we try to do good, we try to help people out, but they fall through the cracks, what the system tells them, right? Here, he's kind of lit in that fire again to see that, yeah, there is can be change made with all hands on deck, right? It takes a village to raise a kid, just the same thing. It takes everybody to raise this community, right? And I feel like ever since we did the Transform of Your World conference, I feel like more people understand. Uh, with Nana Ikapono and Operation Blue Light Christmas, I feel like more people trusted us that we're not always the bad guys. You know, we're not always gonna be there to scold you. So like by um, having us pass out gifts or just being involved in the community like tonight, you know, it's just like having that partnership, that growing partnership with the community. But this is what it's about. On the west side, we take care of each other and the community really takes care of each other. And the, the response and the joy that you feel on this day, it is just so wonderful. This is how it should be the rest of the state. So mahalo nanakuli. The fact that we've come through this has taught us a lot about ourselves, our community, and the resilience and the spirit of our people. So now is the time to be joyous, and now is the time more than ever to have gratitude in our hearts. But what really changed is when the Lord touched him and says, you need to be in love with Nana Kuli, and built so many different relationships because like um, our councilwomen, they they know that they can't do it alone. So put your hands together for Representative Stacy Eli, who God's using to just transform Nanakuli. So Rep Eli. There are so many times that I've had to ask Pastor Allen for his help. Not just his guidance and you know the path that I should take, 
but asking for his help when the community was at odds with within with each other. It's just been a lot, you know. I like I'm man, like I appreciate like what everyone had to say, but truly without God, I could not have done any of the the things that I'm being credited for because it, it's a kako thing and in Hawaii kako you know refers to everyone when it comes to aloha aloha begins with me not in a white house not in the state capital not not in elections aloha begins with me if i don't change the world will never change so i want to be we want to be the change that we want to see out there in the world That's just a little bit of what God is doing. Uh, may I ask all the people who cleared their schedules to be here at the request of Pastor Creighton from the West Side. Would you stand up? All the West Side people, would you stand up? I see Kainoa, Kini. All, all the people from the West Side, would you guys stand up? All the people from the West Side that come, all the people from the West Side. There you go. There you go. These are the heroes. These are the people that have the faith to believe for God. It's not just Pastor Allen. We're better together. We're stronger together. And this is just a little bit of the, the army of believers that God is doing. Thank you, guys. You guys may be seated. So this is, again, a snapshot of shifting the spiritual climate. So what's the key in shifting the spiritual climate? Again, Ed talked about it. We need to bless people, not blast them. We need to be peacemakers, not troublemakers. We need to help people, not hurt people. We need to speak prophetically, not pathetically. In other words, look for the treasures in people, places, and problems, not the trash. We speak for the word of God, not the word of the world, and so forth. So that's how we shift the spiritual climate. But really, the key is this. It's, it's really the key the Bible teaches us is being peacemakers, not troublemakers. That's it. Anybody can make a troublemaker, but how does it shift the spiritual climate? I mean, I remember, that's why when I was downstairs, I turned around, I'm like, oh no, I got to go back to the place. <laughs> that place where I was just, just loading up on a B-52s, chasing them with uh, Long Island IC, and I, I realized I'm no longer a troublemaker. I mean, I was dealing with that when I turned around, like, oh, 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 going back up. I'm no longer that person I was 20 years ago. I've been redeemed and restored. I've been arrested by the power of the Holy Spirit, but I'm a new creation to be able to shift and change the spiritual climate because my God is an awesome God. And that's the thing. The world will know that we're the children of God as, as we walk for peace and we go for the peace and prosperity of the city and praying for it. It's easy to pray, but can we roll up our sleeves and do what these people are going to share that they're doing? That's the key. Church doesn't start on Sunday. It starts on Monday. Right? And especially hump day, Wednesday, and so forth. So I'm setting up the, uh, this for the team. But what's not working? We know that blasting people doesn't work. We ain't going to do, do that anymore. We knowing that being a troublemaker ain't going to work. We're not going to do that. Hurting people does not work. Doing nothing doesn't work. Looking for the trash and posting on social media, that doesn't work. I mean, we got to, people are asking, Alan, we got to do something. Well, I tell you what, we're going to do something. But this is not what we're going to do. That's not the culture. We're after Yesu culture. And you're going to hear these people sharing. So that's causing divisions, getting angry. When you get angry, you give the devil jurisdiction and authority over your city. Well, but I go to church. Yeah, but how do you act the rest of the week? I mean, I'm talking about me, okay? <laughs> talking about me. And, and I realized the only person I can control on a good day, even Sundays, is myself. And do you know how much work that takes? <laughs> So that's not working. So what is? Moving forward from doing church once a week to doing church every day. I am the church. I mean, I'm having a conversation with a denomination. You really got into some stuff. It's not about the building of property. It's me. I'm on a ground and line up. I'm, the, I'm your guy, and we're going to help rebuild. So again, it's learning how to do what Ed said. So without uh, further ado, again, uh, if you want to learn more, we're just going to give you guys samples, like Sam's Club and Costco samples. <laughs> That's all you're going to do. And, and they got a tight time frame because we want to honor the time and so forth. All we're going to do is dish out samples that this stuff called the Ecclesia works. 
And again, God is so good. A lot of the people that following us are not part of NPC. We're not trying to build NPC at all. We're after the kingdom of God. And many of these people that follow us, they, they go to different churches. They're part of different ministries. Some people go New Hope. Some people go Hope Chapel. Some people have no hope. Some people are not believers. No, seriously. Serious. Because he or she who has the greatest hope leads. You can have the title, but do you have the hope to cope and the hope to float? Right? So again, anyways, I can go off on the rapping and all of that, but we're not going to do it there. But I just want you to, I just want you to, I just want you to get a, a picture of the kingdom, the Isis Ecclesia, right? It, it, it's different people with the same heart and same vision. So with that said, I want to start off that we are working with the government, and I want to honor Don, Dara Young. Dara Young was the administrator. Uh, he was running the Honu Project, that transition from the police to the city. It's just amazing God that God is using. I want to honor him because he, he saw, he was a strong believer, is a strong believer. Um, he saw how church and government can work together, how we can break down the walls. He was an innovator and we we're honored to be part of that. Um, he was, again, part of the community-based development under um, the mayor's office. Um, and then this is the latest project we just, we just finished up. As the Ecclesia got involved to support the city, um, we had, in a Honu project on Waianae side, we had 145 people that were homeless that checked in. Under 145 people, 80 of them were placed in uh, shelters, 65 in a shelter, some in a hospital treatment. Uh, one was relocated back to their families and so forth. So this is a testament of what the ecclesia can look like if we look for the treasures, not just in our church, but look for the treasures in our city and break down the barriers that separate us. Uh, again, uh, you can go to Hono's site, but for the lack of time, I'm just gonna move forward. I wanna play one more video, and this will introduce the team that I'm gonna call up in a little bit. One of the most radical things, and, and because of Susan Mahiai and Manam, I've been in ministry for over 20 years, and when we did make the news, it's often in a negative way. But in the last six months, and crime has gotten worse, actually. It's gotten worse since the last Operation Blue Light Christmas. But the glory of God is fully alive. And the media have been talking about faith and God. And this is one of the most unlikely uh, news organizations that I thought would do this wonderful, amazing video. So check this out. Seven twelve right now, an unlikely alliance is working to disrupt illegal gambling on the west side. That's what Chad Blair and Honolulu Silva Beat are focusing on this morning. Chad, we're talking grandmas and gangsters here, right? <laughs> Great headline for yeah. Civil Beat. I got to give credit to our reporter, Jack Truesdale, as long with our photographer, Jack Fujii, or Kevin Fujii. They went out to the west side of Oahu and took photos and met people. And this is about a group of, yes, ex-gangsters, people mm -hmm. that were recovering from drugs, people who have spent time in jail, but also uh, grandmas, women in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. And what they're doing is they're standing up up in the community and saying no more illegal game rooms, no more drugs and guns. And they're doing that by reaching out and talking directly to their neighbors. Okay, and so maybe we focus on, on one at a time. We talk about gangsters. There's one particular man named Mana. What has he done within that community? Well, he's got quite a history. It turns out that he started on the path to crime very young. He worked for his dad who ran an illegal a game room, he was the lookout. Later, he ended up serving time for armed robbery. But he found the light, he found God, and he has founded this group called God Forgives Bad Boys and Bad Girls. And it's a Christian ministry, and it operates out of a transitional home out there. So he and others actually, you know, they know people. They've been involved, if you will, with the darker side, and they will reach out to people and say, you can't be here anymore. You can't bring your drugs. You can't bring your gambling. And by the way, while you're here, maybe find out about the good word. Yeah, which is interesting because they're, they're not just telling authorities about these people. They're confronting them themselves. And, it, and it's not just the former gangsters. We're talking about grandmas, uh, women... <laughs> 
65 and above that are out there on the streets in the morning hours. Yeah, right? another Early story, morning. another story that Jack and Kevin managed to, to work with. And so, yes, what happens is they get tipped off that, hmm, a game room is coming into our neighborhood or there's a, a drug house. So what they do is after dark, these women show up and they bring those nightsticks, those blue nightsticks, <laughs> they turn them on. And you can imagine what a deterrent that is. If somebody's showing up to gamble or to get drugs, you see all these aunties with their blue nightsticks, you're going to say, you know, maybe I better go away and come back another time. Yeah. We should also mention Mana himself. Uh, he, he's not out of the woods just yet. He's still got some legal battles coming up. Yeah, they're serious legal battles. He is facing felony charges on meth distribution. You'll actually see in the photos, he, he's wearing an ankle bracelet. Yeah. So he'll have his time in court again. But for now, I think an HPD officer told Jack that one of the most important things is, we don't know exactly how successful it is, but if you got your neighbors looking out for each other, that's the best hope that you can have for any community dealing with drugs and guns and other terms types of violence. Yeah, all right, good stuff. It's fascinating to read. You need to check it out. Thank you, Chad. Uh, you can read the full story at civilbeat.org and text 66866 for their newsletter. All right. <laughs> Isn't this amazing? With that said, we Mana and the NSW that we have going on today would not be here if not for these two women. So I'm going to call up Jody and Ivalani. They're the one that started it years ago. <laughs> 12 years, it's been a brutal journey. Again, they bought their blue lights and so forth. So we're gonna have them share very briefly of, um, yeah, just what it's like today to see God move in a powerful way. So mahalo, thank you for cleaning your guys' schedule. Aloha everyone, I'm Jody Akao, and that was actually the first time I saw that video. And I am one of the grandmas. And <laughs> The rest of the ladies that are not here this evening is, um, they are, the oldest is 87 today. And, and they're still kicking with us, yes. So I wanna share with you about the NSW is a neighborhood security watch. And it is true what the video did, what he did say about us, is that when we found out, when someone will call us in our community and say, hey, I think we have drug activity going on over here. There's a lot of traffic, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. So when I heard that, I called our grandmas and said, hey, guys, we're out tonight. OK, so we'll meet you guys about 1230 a.m. And so they said, OK, where are we going? And I said, well, the address is 91018 Kahalapu'uli Street. And they said, OK, we'll meet you there. And then they all came and met with us and they said, oh, isn't this the drug activity house? And I said, yes, it is. I said, so let's all get ready, turn around, let's lay hands and pray over it. <laughs> and so we do use these um, blue sticks. It does go on. It's very dark, 1 a.m. in the morning, and all you see is blue down the street. So we, we said, okay, the cars are getting ready. The buyers are all coming down the road. Here they come. Let's, let's watch them. Let's just stand here and watch them. And then, so we noticed that one car was coming down. The car made a U-turn quickly. <laughs> and then so one of the kupunas was saying, hey, what happened? And I said, they're not going to come here. But watch, okay? So then after that, the, the dealer came out of the house. And he goes, hey, what's happening? I said, well, we heard there was a party out here and we wanted to know what was going on because there was heavy traffic coming around here. And so the buyer called up the dealer and said, hey, you got cops off in front of your house. <laughs> and then he says, no, that's all my neighbors. <laughs> and so with this being said, we took down five drug houses in one gaming room in our community. Thank you. Everything that Jody said is true. Um, you know, I just asked the Holy Spirit to lead me. Um, as you see the statistics, you know, um, I want to share how powerful the Ecclesia um, NSW is and what it has done. Um, I'll start with what Pastor Dent said. The bus up. That was me. I was bus up. You know, I was still married. I believed in my marriage. My husband was dealing with addiction. I didn't want drugs in my family. 
nor did I want it in my community, in my homestead, nor did I want it in the state because I witnessed murder in my family at a very young age, um, what today is called sex trafficking with my sister. So I, I carried that um, for 30 something years when she was murdered at the Hilton Hawaiian where we had our to Hawaii, the day that God set me free. So I was bust up with all of that, um, you know, and the powerful of the ecclesia was that as I was bus up in a little place in Nanaikapona Church, mm-hmm. I had my children and they, they latched on me and I was able to team up with this wonderful woman, Jody. that I was like, I don't want it, but I want my marriage. How do you continue to do that? I just plugged in with Pastor Allen, as broken as bus up I was, I went healing hearts. And the greatest things when it came to the Ecclesia uh, teachings, and which we call the NSW from District 8, but I call it the Ecclesia NSW. So when you bust up, you don't want to go anywhere. You want to hide. But what I did is I, I moved toward God because that's all I could do. When you're in a situation, a statistics as me, as a native, you have everything about you. But I wasn't going to let it define me. So... Instead of being bust up, I had to bust out. And bust out is how um, I'm going to be attending the Ecclesia for the fifth time. And you're talking, I entered the Ecclesia before the COVID, broken, not knowing my marriage, my children. I didn't want them to be a sister six. And I can tell you today, they're not. Today, my, um, my youngest of my son, Full Ride Scholarship, University of Providence. He went over there. Um, my old, my um, third oldest is frontline in Lahaina right now, on the front lines and searching recovery. 21 year old. I'm praying for him because no 21 year old can see the things that he's seen. But I'm busting out, and I'm not just busting out by myself. I have a wonderful church that just kept kept loving on me. And then I had Jody. The power of the ecclesia is that I didn't know where I was going, but I knew I loved God and I wanted to change. I didn't want what I was seeing um, all my life. You know, I, I, I was just still dealing from things as a childhood. Aces is real, you know, but the ace that I had was Jesus. Yeah. And I continued to go. And in that journey um, of busting out, God was working with me and everything that I was going through, finding myself, finding out where I'm going to go. And the ecclesia uh, helped structure me in a framework to be um, spiritually fit and ready to battle for the things. And um, when I look at where I am today, I'm not bust up. I'm busting out. But today I'm going to say I'm busting the move for Jesus. And because, and busting that move is that um, the ecclesia has changed myself, that has changed my family, and has changed my community. And when I look at everything that's coming right now, um, I, I just been um, uh, asked to, to newly be hired. And I, I want to share with you why I feel the ecclesia is very important. And it's a structure. If you want to serve God, I didn't, I had so much emotions, but the ecclesia kept me accountable. It kept me moving. It kept me, instead of being idle and feeling sorry, I was just drawing on to God. I didn't know, but God knew. So um, where is my phone? I, I want to share you like how much God knew where I was going. So you have to think that when I wrote, I don't know if you guys know about your transitional life plan, but I am moving on mine. And when God gave me my traditional life plan, I was broken. I was bust up. I didn't know where to go. And I, I went to Conahealy Park where Jody was, and I was like, Lord, oh, come on, give me the vision. And um, I can share with you today. Um, this is the vision he gave to me and that I can tell you that I'm living it out today. That's how good that God knew where I was going, even when I was bust up. Okay, where is my glasses? 
Okay. Can you hold this? Too? So while she looked for his, her glasses, basically the ecclesia is the accelerator. It's part of, you know, our culture. And what she's talking about, her TLP, it's a transformation life plan. That as we journey together, she wrote down her identity, her point of inception from her, for her family, the community, etc. So that's what she's pulling out now that's going to share in a brief and amazing way. Okay. And, and how this came is that as I was bus up, you know, we had this serial rapist in Kapolei. And then at 12 o'clock, I'm on my knees praying, yeah, like, Lord, help my marriage. Lord, help my community, my kids. Then I hear, hooey, hooey. And I'm like, I know that's not God. <laughs> he must say, hooey. And I'm like, hooey. And I'm like, what is, that sound like Jody, but 1230. I look out, the, I look out my door, it's her and two kapunas, our ADO kapunas, outside of by my middle school, making sure we safe. And this one touched me and I told myself, they fighting for my family. They putting their self at risk. That day I decided I was all in with Jesus. And a few weeks later, it was my first um, ecclesia. And I wrote my TLP, which was about two and a half years ago. And I can read to you what it said. I wrote, I am a faith-filled woman of God with unshakable confidence in the power of God's promises and divine purpose he has for me in the leadership of my homestead community. Despite all the challenges I've encountered in my life, in my community, I walk my community with the fruits of the Spirit, overflowing with abundant aloha. I choose to bless and not blast. I make it my kuleana to pray over my communities, DHHL, HFD, DOE, elected officials from the city, state, and federal, family and friends, etc., to declare godly transformation in our homestead community and all communities. I am driven by God's goodness to rise up every day in my community, committed to be the ecclesia in bringing unity back in communities. And, <laughs> and he gave me this almost three years ago, this Tuesday. I accepted the position as the Shaw Disaster Relief Coordinator. I know my calling, and I am moving with the body. You know, and the life of the land perpetuated in righteousness. My people is hurting. You know, it's my kuleana now to build housing, to bring healing, not just to my homestead, just to all communities. And today, I declare as the head of that position that I wouldn't do it without God. And I need all the churches to go for it with us to build back our communities and our people. So why do I share about the ecclesia and how powerful it is? Because I can imagine what it can do for everybody else. And I share that today because today I walk not by myself now. I walk with not just my pastor, but many pastors that have put the time into us and believe in us from this one woman's vision that transferred me and my family. Help answer Mana's prayer, my 12 years prayer that Akane came from the transitional housing. And today, we is a tree cord. And with our sister Susan, we taking back our community. We not allowing any crisis to take over our family. We are bringing Christ in the crisis. So mahalo. Everybody. Amen. Mahalo. Would you put your hands together? So God is so good. God is so good. So God is, God used these two to create a revolution of aloha. So at this point in time, I want to call out Mana and Officer Roland Pagan to be able to share from these two ladies that wanted to give up 12 years ago that only had ladies and grandmas. Now God is moving in a powerful way to bring ex-gangsters to join in the spiritual fight. So what you put together and the unlikely alliance right here, Mana and Officer Roland Pagan. Oh, hallelujah. You know, it's been a journey uh, in this season with Jesus and the Holy Spirit, yeah? 
And so, you know, I wanted to share, I just wanted to give you guys uh, a little of the old creation, right? And so I've been locked up 26 years in incarceration, right? I was a shot caller uh, for two yards, one in California, one in Oregon. A shot caller is like the mouthpiece on a prison yard who solved problems. And I also was a gang leader for one of the most vicious prison gangs in Hawaii, in a prison of Hawaii, on the streets of Hawaii, and Las Vegas, Nevada. And uh, you know, uh, you know, when they ask me what is this, right? I tell them this is not the uh, new I watch. This is the new I got it. A minute. But I share with you that because, <clears throat> you know, uh, I wanted to uh, share how God, the Holy Spirit, revealed to me of seeds that was planted in my life as a child, right? Because I thought my life, uh, my, my, my old creation started was incarceration. No, it started when I was a child. Growing up, <clears throat> growing up, my dad, like, like you heard earlier, growing up, my dad used to run a dice game down Kewala Basin. And at 10 years old, he told me, Mana, <clears throat> go stand on this wood, I'm 10 years old now, stand on this wood, right, and watch for the car with the antenna. Little did my dad know that he was planting one seed in me that made me believe that the guy with the antenna is the bad guy. And then, <clears throat> and then when we drive in a car, he told me, Mana, sit down, the police stay in the front. Oh, I'm 10 years old, <clears throat> right? I'm thinking to myself, that's the enemy, right? So let me fast forward now. Growing up with that frame of mind, with that seed being planted, in 1989, my sibling, my older brother, he escaped from prison, right? And three days later, they caught him, and my brother passed away. But this is the part. When I went down to Ivole to view the body, there was this paperwork that said homicide. And the only people that I knew was involved with my brother's death was Honolulu Police Department. And what happened was, from the seed that was planted to me as a child, now emotions got involved. Hate, vengeance. And let me share how tricky the adversary is because it started off with Honolulu Police Department, then it went to the correctional officer, then it went to anybody in uniform, then it went to anybody in authority. And I live like that for many, many years. Well, let me share something. Let me testify and give you the praise report, right? I met up, up Big Brother Allen, I think it was in July, my, one of my NSWs with the Kumus, right down uh, uh, Keolanas in Nanakule. And um, when I met him, right, <clears throat> uh, he invited me to a, a, a gathering he had. And when I went there, you know, he does things spontaneous. So if it's spontaneous for him, it's spontaneous for me, <laughs> right? But he told me, you're going to ride in the front seat of the police car. Never did in my life. <laughs> and not only ride in the front seat of the police car, but stick your two hands out with no handcuffs. Hallelujah. <laughs> The reason, the reason, let me tell you why. Because my thought was, his friend's gonna steal me in a police car again. But he just got upgraded from the back seat to the front seat. But still got handcuffs. So I wanted his friends to know, he no more handcuffs, he never do nothing wrong. That's why, I just wanted to share that. But little did he know, right, that I was being released from all that stuff that was living with me for so many. He didn't know that, I didn't know that, that I was getting released, right? right in the police car. And then uh, he invited me to another gathering, right? And spontaneously again, he asked me, Mana, can you pray over the Honolulu Police Department? <laughs> so spontaneously I said yes. <laughs> but when I prayed for the HPD officers, right? Little do I know that I was getting released again. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so, <clears throat> you know, after this gathering, we were doing a lot of NSW walks with the Kumus in the neighborhoods. And so we've built a relationship, right? Now, I don't call him officer. I call him brother Roland, amen, right? But let me share what happened on the last walk that we had. When we were walking down, God was showing me and speaking to me. And then on the way back, right? Walking back to where we started, I put up to brother Roland. And I told him, hey, brother Roland, I'd like to share something with you. <clears throat> I said, you know, I share with him about my brother. I share with him the effects I had from my brother. 
I've shared with him of what caused this thinking, my way of life, and the lies and stronghold that the adversary had on me. And I told Roland that today, you my brother. Wow. That these uniforms and tattoos no separate us. <laughs> and, you know, before I introduce him, right, I want to share this, yeah? This is about the second or third time that we're, going, we're sharing the platform with each other. And it's very uncommon and it's very abnormal to see one guy locked up 26 years who never liked HPD, who's a short caller, right, gang leader, sharing the, the pulpit with my brother Rollins. So right now, I'd like to introduce my brother Rollins. Thank you for coming. <laughs> now, um, you know, I, I, I met Pastor Allen. Fortunately, um, there was a picture of our team and stuff like that. There was another young lady that worked with us that introduced me to Pastor Allen. And, um, you know, when I first met him, we were getting involved in the Blue Light Christmas event where the community, the church, uh, volunteers donated gifts to give to the kids. You know, I told Pastor Allen that... Um, I've been doing this job for 24 years now, almost 25 years. Um, right after COVID is when we got involved. Up until then, there was never a day that I got up in the morning and dreaded having to go to work. Not saying that I got up and cheered that I had to go to work, but <clears throat> there was never a day that I said, I don't want to go to work. COVID hit, everything changed. People looked at us differently because of what we had to do, what they didn't believe, what was happening and why we had to do this kind of stuff. And I told Pastor Allen, I said, up until then, I never felt like I just don't want to go to work. I met Pastor Allen. Um, we got involved with the, the Blue Light Christmas. And I told him, I said, you know, he was put in my path, I believe, to, to revitalize um, the joy I had of doing my job before that. You know, so, you know, I, I thank Pastor Allen for that. Then I met, you know, Mana, like I said, at the, at the Blue Light Christmas, you know, and I look at him, you know, in my job, we deal with a lot of people and I try not to judge people based on the way they look. You know, I have my tattoos and stuff like that. And, um, you know, but I, I try not to judge people. I got to know him, got to know his story and everything else. Um, and then we got to know each other. We started going out and, and working with Auntie Jody and the NSWs and stuff like that. It was great because we saw them coming out to the communities. And it didn't just, it started in Nanakuli that they started branching out to Eva Beach and Waianae and then Kalihi and all over the island. Uh, I think Ati Jody was trying to, I wish I could have gone, but uh, it was Molokai, right? Where were we going to go? Molokai. They were doing a trip to Molokai to get an SW started in Molokai. So, you know, their efforts were there. Fast forward to um, just a couple of weeks ago, when we were doing that talk, the walk that Mano was talking about. You know, Mano told me about his brother and, and the feelings that he was carrying. And, and I had never known this because of the interactions that we had. You know, I, I felt that we had a bond and stuff like that. And um, I didn't know that he was still carrying that burden with him. Um, I felt blessed that day. And, and it really it hit home the next morning because he called me in the morning. And I could tell he had just gotten up. And he called me and said, you know what, brother, I just want to let you know that. You know, I never shared that story with anybody in uniform. And because of that, um, I feel that I've been released. And, and, and I thank God that I was in that position for him and for me. You know, Manu's, Manu's been a, 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 a big part of the community and stuff like that. I tell everyone I have a 15-year-old son drives me crazy. Um, I've had my struggles, and even I felt that I had to call Mana a couple times to get his perspective on what's going on, and, and now I can work on that relationship with him. So I just want to thank you guys for letting me come and share. Thank you, Pastor Allen. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Pastor Cal, thank you. God bless you.
reconciliation. Amen. The five pivotal paradigms. Luke chapter 10. And people being obedient to the call of God. It's God super upon our natural. And um, this is not just for Nana Cooley. This is for all of Hawaii. This is for us. So at this point in time, um, we're just going to call up the last one. Um, again, the last couple of months have been, been tough, and uh, especially with the number of shootings. And so we're going to call up Susan Mahiai. She's going to share very briefly. Her 17-year-old daughter got shot on our side of the island. And, and I, was, I was like um, <clears throat> looking for treasures in, in the tragedies in our community. And, and I told our team and I told our people, the devil messed with the wrong girl, mess with the wrong family, in the wrong community at the wrong time. Glove came off. I, you thought I was crazy before <laughs> before this year? Uh, I'm at a whole new another level to see God move in a powerful way. And it's because of people like this. So would you put your hands together for Susan Mahiai as she comes up and share. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ali. Good morning, good morning, good morning, family. I feel loved and I feel blessed to be in God's house today. Thank you guys for having me. You know, when this first started, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Susan Maiai. My daughter is the little girl that got shot in her head, the 17 year old. Um, so when I first got into this situation, yeah, um, I was confused, I was lost. I never know how to pro you know, process this and, you know, and, Thank you, Jesus. The seed was planted in me when I was a little girl. I always knew that when there was a problem, I could be happy, sad, glad, mad. I always knew that God was by my side. I knew I could latch on to him and he had me. So when this incident went happen, I know the only one could help me in this situation and help my daughter, help save my daughter was God. So I went put all of myself into this. All of me, inside out, like Pastor was saying about my inside match my outside. Yes, I never have no resentments. I wasn't angered. I wasn't mad. I wouldn't love these guys that did this to my daughter, yeah? God told me for love them in order for him to heal my daughter. And that's exactly what I did, yeah? I prayed and I prayed. They told me she only had two to three days to live. I will rebuke that in the mighty name of Jesus. I wasn't going to give the doctors the authority for, for put them in charge of my daughter's life. And when that third day came, you know, I was thinking, okay, God was resurrected in three days, yeah? We go, I go give you guys that three days, yeah? The third day came, you know, I rebuke, I rebuke, I pray, 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 pray. I never did pray and cry so much in my life. But, you know, God will prepare me for this season. You know, I'm exactly where I need to be. And God was able to save her on the third day. Yeah? So now the doctors come in and she's going to die from this now. What? Pray, pray, pray. God save her again. You know? So it's like, die, die, die. Yeah? Save, save, save. <laughs> yeah? Love, love, love. Heal, heal, heal. Forgive, forgive, forgive. All that good stuff. So, fast forward, and, and, and this was the waves for me, yeah? I just continued to have faith, continued to believe, continued to share love. Not only, I mean, every person that I came across, every person, inside and outside of the hospital, I'd be walking down the hall, I love you, I love you. God just told me for love everybody, yeah? So, oh, I need water. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> So I came into this season. God said, okay, Sue, you need for stop, yeah? You need for stop and you need for be still. Because watch this, one other wave gonna come. So, you know, she came out of Queens, she went into the rehab, but by then, oh, I only get 10 minutes on here. <laughs> well, she almost would pass away again, put it that way, yeah? But this time, I never have everybody for uplift me, so I was alone with this. God. God, my daughter, and me in this room, stuck in this hospital room at Queens for two weeks and two days. Her brain would end up swelling up again. She was uh, 
uh, full with spinal fluid, uh, started crushing her brainstem. And we all know when your brainstem cross, you brain dead, yeah? So I went into prayer. I drop on my knees. I cry. I cry. I cry. I pray. I pray. I went cry myself, praying to sleep, guys. God told me, be still and know that he God. And that he got her. I need to remember that because he with the miracles he will show me left and right, left and right. Okay, yes, God. I shut down my phone. I shut down social media. I go into mean scripture readings, mean praying. I even watch all kind of Bible movies. <laughs> I watch them all. <laughs> and God was able to get her out of this season. She catch on fever. She catch on infection. She gonna die again? No, 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 no. God said no. God said his will and his time. Yes, God, I follow you. You tell me move, I move. I move real quick, real quick, you know? And she's out. She's out. This is the third day. Here she goes again, back in the ambulance, back to the rehab. That's how strong my faith is. She gonna die, that's okay. God, I accept. You taking her life, you take her life, not nobody else. I accept with love. I'm going to embrace this, whatever decision he make, you know. But I am going to ask, yeah? And I am going to pray real hard, Lord, for you for you have mercy and please save her. Because I know you can. I saw miracles, guys, with two of my eyes. Nobody going to tell me nothing, yeah? Nobody going to tell me nothing. I trip, you know, like in the Bible verses, yeah? They tell about the miracles. Yeah, that's my daughter. He tell me for move, he tell me for share. I gonna glorify and I gonna praise his name every chance I get. Because he good. He good and he gotta know that even if we in the darkness, that's okay. There is the light and we can get love and we can have be warm. So I was telling brother Mana, yeah? Something went pop into my head when I was sitting over there. God went talk to me. You like know what we gotta do? Just had one big fight down in front of Wina High School today. That's the kind of stuff we gotta do. We gotta go to those places as soon as after happened and pray over there. So that stop. That stop in that place be filled with love. If not, that place in Wina High School always gonna have fights and always gonna have problems. And that's the kind of stuff I'm going to do. God going to tell me, forget out and, and glorify and praise his name. There I am, front, up front and center. With that said, guys, we need to not only be here in the church to praise and fellowship. No, we got to go out there. We got to go in the communities. We got to go to people's houses. We got to go to where the stuff happened. Bless so the thing can be washed away and set free and clean. With that said, guys, I love each and every one of you guys. I say these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> hey, Susan, come back, Susan. Susan, come back. Come back. How many of you have been blessed? This is not just a, a, a teaching kind of thing. Ed showed the biblical foundation. These couple of people showed the impartation and the fire of God in people. And it's for all of us to catch it. So how many of you want the fire and the blessings and the impartation, right? She, she looked a little bit down today, though. She looked a little bit depressed. So, But that's okay. That's okay. Compared to what some of us look like, can you pray the fire and just a blessing and impartation upon all of us, Susan? All right. All right. Woo. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we just come to you today, Father God, in agreement with your love, your peace, Father God, your forgiveness, Lord Jesus, that we be able to come out from here, Lord Jesus, and share with everybody your love, Lord Jesus, and that when there's issues, there's problems, even if we're happy, Lord Jesus, we can always come to you and give it to you, Lord Jesus. Continue to bless each and one of us, Lord Jesus. Please put a shield of protection 
protection over us, our family, friends, and loved ones, Father God. I would like to reach out and say a prayer for Maui. Lahaina, Lord Jesus. Please continue to rebuild. Rebuild that city, Father God. And let it be dedicated to you in your name, Lord Jesus. Please save the families, Lord Jesus. Fill them with warmth and love, Father God. That there is a light, Lord Jesus. And you are the only light, Father God. You are the one that we come to, Father God, in our time of need. And we know that you love us, Lord Jesus. We continue to praise you and glorify your name, Father God. That's how much we love you, Lord. And we just thank you so much for you loving us the way that you do. We say these things in your precious and glorious name, Father God. Amen. All right. Turn it back to Pastor Crate and thanks you guys. Malama Pono Ohuiho. Aloha. Yeah, could you help me to say thank you to Pastor Allen, to Mari, and their entire team? It's just amazing, you know, God is showing us um, what's happening in Nanakuli, and, you know, Ed's really uh, a father of what's happening in Hawaii. Um, but I just want to remind us that as we honor one another and we steward the small things in our life, that it's not about you and your fish and your loaves. It's really God as our multiplier. So we um, are going to take a 10-minute break. Um, the, the bathrooms are right around the corner. Um, I want to encourage you. You know, there's just been a fire hose of information. So if you want the slides, um, please give your email at the resource table and I'll see you back in 10 minutes with Ed to wrap us up. Yep, yep. Hey, before you go, you guys, um, we got this Bless No Blast shirts. If you guys want them, Mari's going to be out there in the lobby. Every single penny is going to go back to the Honolulu T Police Department. So this year, they can pass out 2,000 free gifts to the children out there. So again, get these Bless No Blast shirts. Mari's going to be outside. Thank you again so much for supporting us. God bless. That last session was awesome. You know, I feel like a, like a lawyer saying, I rest my case, okay? <laughs> is that theory is demonstration of the principles. And I hope that you are grabbing it, okay, and saying, I want to be like that lady or that police officer or that man, you know, and so forth. So this session, is landing the plane, okay? We already took off, we reached cruising altitude, okay, but now we need to land the plane. So I'm gonna be very practical about it, as much as I can. In my younger years, I have a guy who offered to fly me on a just mono engine plane, and uh, you know, and I'm going to heaven, but I'm not in a hurry to get there. Uh, I'm not afraid of death, but I don't want to meet it yet, you know? And when you are on a plane, just you and the pilot with only one engine, the thought pops up in your mind, what if the engine quits, you know? So finally, I asked the pilot, he said, oh, you mean like this? And he turned it off. <laughs> you know, I said, well, we are descending at so many feet a second, we have so much time before we crash. Okay, I get it, I get it, boom. And he turned it on again. And I said, okay, okay, that's reassuring. Uh, but what if, if I drop dead, you mean? Yes, I'm glad you said it. <laughs> well, uh, I'm gonna show you how to, how to fly. I mean, don't tell the government, but I'll show you so that you can. So first he showed me how to use the radio. And then I learned how to take off. And that was easy because you just line in the right direction, you know give you all the power and journey and make it reach cruising altitude. That's the easiest part. But the real tough part was landing because uh, you're landing on visuals and you have to align the angle with the lights that are on the side of the thing. So that took a lot of fine tuning. But I feel that we have reached cruising altitude. Would you agree with me? But now we need to say, how do we land it, okay? So I'm gonna give you some 
perspectives, and then we're going to close with an impartation. But at the book table, I think we run out of books, but if you go to our website, you will find them. There are three that I strongly recommend. One is prayer evangelism, which you have heard a lot about Luke 10. But if you know the why of what, then you can do it as a lifestyle. The other one is anointed for business, for you to know that you need the anointing not only to come to church, but you need it everywhere you are. And my wife wrote the book, wrote a couple of books, so one is faith-building stories, and there she teaches that uh, you cook under the anointing. You know, you chop the onions in the name of the Lord. You fry the hamburgers in holy oil. You bring it to the table, you know, under the anointing. And then your backsliding family members and rebellious, they eat holy food and boom, they have a, a power encounter. And that's biblical. You know, Paul's garments set people free. Jesus' garment transferred the anointing. Paul's uh, Peter's shadow healed people and so forth. And, uh, and then the other book, actually there are four books, not three, is Ecclesia. It will show you that you are the church under your pastor's covering, okay? They are our spiritual fathers and mothers. But everywhere you go, I mean, like these folks in Nada Cooley, I think the devil has a migrant headache every day, right? Because every scheme that he concocted, they are just blowing it away. But you have to know why you are the Ecclesia. Because when you move into the enemy's camp, he will try to make you doubt. He will try to belittle you. Oh, who are you? And you have to say, I am the anointed one. I am not the best one, but I'm the anointed one. I am not the best guy to lead T.O.W. There are people with more money, more training, bigger churches, but that doesn't count. I am the anointed one. He picked me, and I will not embarrass him. And that's what we transfer to you today. You are the anointed. But it has to begin in your home, in your home. So there is something else I want to encourage you to seriously consider it. Because you have a lot going, and the devil can bribe you with what you have going, and God wants you to take what you have going and go for the much more. And our relationship with many of you began when many of you came to our conference in Argentina, and you were able to see it there, and you were able to connect with people that were doing it. And then you realize it's not about me, it's about a community globally. And what we witnessed in the previous hour is needed desperately all over the world. What God is doing in Nanakuli and Chinatown and other communities, California is dying to get something like that. And I want to encourage you, I want to exhort you, I want to give you a strong pat in the lower back and say you should come to our global conference in California. It's in October, and, uh, and if you cannot come, and that's okay, sometimes people have other, you should sign up to participate globally, virtually, so that you can watch it. And we are assigning a special place to Hawaii so that people like Alan Cardenas or Carl Chiden or Francis Oda will take the very best that happened that day and she will impart it to you. If you cannot devote two and a half days to watch it online, you will be able to watch those 90 minutes and you will get the most of it. So I'm going to play a short, short video that I did with my best friend, my personal intercessor, the love of my life, the mother of four daughters, favorite grandmother-in-law, okay, for four sons, Ruth. Watch it and receive it and treat the conference, if you are a pastor, as a summer trip. But you send people on a summer trip, people wash cars, they sell junk, they have garage sales, they raise the money 
to go and invest someplace else, and then you come back with more. Okay, let's play that video, and then I'll come back for the teaching, please. <clears throat> Hello, we are Edel Ruth Silvoso, and we have something exciting to share. I am sure you are saturated with bad news, but you know what? The gospel is good news. It never changed. Never changed. That's why we want to invite you to an extraordinary conference for you to see, feel, and touch what God is doing. Things you don't hear about much on the news. It's going to be tremendous. Your life will never be the same. And you will take this to your sphere of influence and you will see darkness receive. Why do we say that? Because transformation moves in concentric circles. It begins with a person. Your life will be totally transformed. For you to become a transformer, the presence of Jesus will do it. From there it goes to the family. Families are being transformed by the manifest presence of Jesus. Yes, because when Jesus comes, everything changes. It doesn't stop in the family. From there, it moves to a spheres of influence. Look at the progression. You are transformed. Your home is transformed. Your neighborhood is transformed. And now it goes to the marketplace. That's why at this conference, you will see ecclesias disguised as transportation companies that are impacting multitudes. You will see ecclesias disguised as schools that are transforming public education. You will even see political parties that have been co-opted by the ecclesia. Every area of our lives is being transformed because the ecclesia is arising. And the place where it's perhaps most impactful is in healthcare. You will be inspired by clinics where the receptionist greets you with a prayer. And the doctors not only treat conditions, they pray. Miracles happen, and the patients receive the Lord right there. Why? Because it is an ecclesia. Isn't that awesome? I mean, you send the kids to school, and the school is an ecclesia. You put them on a bus, and the bus is a mobile Ark of the Covenant. You go to a political meeting, and Jesus is there. You go to a courthouse, and Jesus is presiding. Yes, my friend, is happening. And that is why we want you to come and join us, either live or virtually. Because all of this is leading up to the return of our Lord. Growing up, we were always expecting the Lord to return anytime. Today, we are much closer because transformation is happening in the marketplace. What do we mean that now we are seeing transformation in the marketplace? Because our Lord is waiting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for the Ecclesia until everything has been put under his feet. And this is exactly what is happening. But the conference goes beyond that. We are creating a new nation in a realm that the Babylonian system is trying to co-opt before the Ecclesia gets there, the metaverse. We know from the scriptures that that stone not cut by human hands will strike the clay in the Babylonian system. The system will collapse and that stone will become a mountain and the mountain will fill the earth. The Ecclesia, the combination of technology with the Ecclesia in the metaverse for the kingdom of God to reach regions that haven't been reached yet. Even though this will be taking place live here in Silicon Valley, we have made arrangements for this to be broadcast all over the world at the time that is convenient for you. Can you imagine you and your family receiving in the comfort of your home the best of what God is doing at the conference? And what we mean by that is, yes, you can watch the whole conference, but Every afternoon, instead of workshops, there will be a broadcast in your region of the world. And the person hosting that, which will be one of your own, will be gleaning the very best of what God did during the day for you to enjoy it at home. This will be the best conference ever. 
Don't miss it. The time is now. This is the hour. Our God is on the move, and we are following him. Join. <clears throat> Let me tell you what is the most difficult decision. It's not the money. It's not who will water the plants or feed the pets. It's you putting this on your calendar. That's a prophetic act. Put it there. Say, these dates, we are going to be there. And then God will give you the provision. God will open doors. We see it all the time. Now, let's put this in perspective, because I'm sure the question pops up in your mind. We are talking about changing the world. And look at the chaos all over the world. Look at the mess that we are in. So the question is, what is going on in the world today? In Isaiah 60 says, Arise and shine, for your light has come. Right? We like that part. But then he says, But darkness will cover the earth. Oh, that's spooky. No, actually, that's God dimming the lights in the theater so that only the light on the platform is available. And then it says, and the glory of the Lord will rise upon you if you don't chicken out. And when the glory of the Lord rises upon you, nations will come to the brightness of your light. I want you to receive this, receive this, receive this. Okay? You, are, you have stood up for righteousness. The darkness out there God is managing that. So let me show you. We are in a race with cheerleaders. Would you read it with me loud and clear? Put Tabasco sauce on your voice. One, two, three. Therefore, So key word, patience. This is not instant food. I mean, I came to Hawaii many, many years ago. Some web that is here invited me. We planted a few seeds. And now look how much is happening. So think about the seeds you're running, but you have to run it with patience. So this is the passage that God spoke to us before the pandemic hit. As we all know, the pandemic has changed the world forever. So read it with me. Would you do that, please? One, two, three. God promised once and for all, I will not only, but also the unseen heavenly realm, so that only that which is unshakable will remain, since we have received an unshakable kingdom, we should be extremely thankful and not frightened. Look at the text. God is saying once and for all. This is God's Hail Mary peace. Okay? The game went into overtime, and the one who scores first, a touchdown wins. And he says, I'm going to do two things. I will shake the systems of the world. But more than that, I'm going to shake the unseen spiritual power that I behind that. So there has been a shake-up on health care, proven inadequate to eradicate something like that. Praise God for all the good that they did. A shake-up in government. I mean, we, our leaders in many countries are like chicken with a head cut off, running all over the place. I mean, it's Inadequate. The faith in government is gone. Military, security, praise God for what is going on in Nalakuli. But generally speaking, people are afraid you know, of riots, stealing, and so forth. California is exhibit A. Education. And the next wave is financial. You know, God is shaking. But remember, it's God who is doing the shaking. The question is, what for? Because we live in an evil day. Say evil day. Evil day. evil day is when those unseen spiritual powers co-opt the centers of power that are visible. And they manipulate them 
to the point that they are able to legislate iniquity and make a crime to live in righteousness. We already see that in California. You can go to jail from preaching certain things to your children. They will be taken away from you. Why? It's an evil day. The evil forces have taken over, and I say this with great compassion for the people in government. We are not against them, we are for them, but we have to understand where they are. There is a place called the gates of hell. That's a physical place. Where it is, I don't know, and I don't want directions to it. But there is a physical place called hell. Then you have the principalities and power, and their job is to establish the gates of Hades on earth. Very, very important for us to understand the mess going on. Is that the same thing in hell than the gates of hell? Hell is a physical place. The gates of Hades is the manifestation of hell on earth. That's what is going on today. But the good news is that in the Bible and in history, every evil day was followed by a day of the Lord. I mean, there was an evil day in the garden when Jesus says, the prince of darkness is coming. But 50 days later, there was Pentecost. There was an evil day when Paul, Saul of Tarsus, as he was called, was executing Christians and practicing genocide. And then, boom, Antioch came. You read chapter 13 to 19, and Paul goes through evil day after evil day, but after every evil day, there was a day of the Lord. There was an evil day when Nero began to burn people at the stake, Christians, as torches to light up Rome. But out of that came the revival that transformed Rome. There was an evil day during World War II when millions of lives were sacrificed. But the soldiers that came back to America and to, and to Europe, but mostly to America, they got the taste of life overseas. And the largest missionary movement that took the gospel to every nation came as a result of that. I mean, you have exhibited that here with Y. Wen and Lauren Cunningham. Ruth and I are the fruit of Americans that went to Argentina and they brought the gospel. And look at the fruit that that is bearing. So I want you to receive this. Yes, there is an evil day, but there is a day of the Lord coming. How will that play out? In the same way that hell is a physical place, heaven is a physical place. We don't know where it is, but we'll go there. My father, my mother, my friends are there. They are waiting for me. So that's a counterpart to hell. But then the ecclesia is in the heavenly places, not only physically, but you are taking the presence of the Lord to the police, right, to the hood, to a school, okay? And you are countering the principalities and powers. I don't see any biblical teaching that we can cast down principalities. It's very clear that anybody who believes in the Lord and was baptized can cast out the demon. But there is no verse that I find that you can bind and bring down a principality. So what are we supposed to do? Ephesians. We build up the church, the fullness of the church, in the heavenly places, no longer buffeted by Conflicting winds of doctrine, pulpit versus marketplace, Pentecostal versus non-Pentecostal, rich versus poor. And when the fullness of the church is manifested, it displaces the principalities and power. And eventually they will be brought down, I mean, and sent into the lake of fire. But our job is that one, okay? And then the kingdom of God. So we bring the kingdom of God to counter the gates of Hades. In Nana Kuli, the gates of Hades were all over the place. But look at these ladies. Look at these guys. 
they brought the kingdom of God. So what we are coming against is the Babylonian system. Daniel saw the Finnish play. And he saw the Babylonian system deteriorating from gold all the way to feet with a mixture of iron and clay. That's what we are seeing in the world today. The Babylonian system, the Genesis is in the Tower of Babel. And look at the mission statement. We will build a city for ourselves. Number one, we will reach heaven from our early platform. We will tell heaven what morality should be like. That's what is happening today. Number three, we will make a name and an object of honor and fear. That's what the devil is doing through misguided social media. They cancel you. The next step will be to confiscate your bank accounts or prevent you from exchanging money. They will prosecute you with a RICO statue and things like that because they want you to fear them. But we don't fear them. We fear God. And number four, we will not be scattered to the ends of the earth. If you go to Genesis chapter 11, you will see that this is the mission statement of the Babylonian system way, way back there. And that is what government misguided. We have to be compassionate and loving toward the people that the devil is using to hurt us the way Paul was able to speak forgiveness over Saul of Tarsus. And two or three chapters later, Saul of Tarsus became Paul of Antioch. Can you receive that? Receive it. Okay, so it says that the stone, not cut by human hands, we believe that's the ecclesia, because it's mobile. It's not the building. It's not a Bible expositor. It's something that God uses to strike the Babylonian system, not all the head, not on the shoulders, not on the torso, on the clay that cannot mix with uh, iron. In my book, Ecclesia and Transformation, I say that I believe that clay is populism. Populism is what we see in politics. Everybody's promising what they can never deliver. They want to get elected, I'll give you whatever you want. But the more populism, the bigger the target. When they told David, look how big is Goliath, he says, the bigger the better, because I cannot miss. So that what is happening out there, you see, is making it a target because the system is going to implode. I mean, look at our debt level, look at crime, look at all that. And, and Christians more or less believe that. They have their arguments. Is that before the millennium, after the millennium? But I'm here to tell you that that is not the end of the game. Once a stone strikes the Babylonian system, it turns into a mountain. It grows. And so whatever you're doing with the church you're leading, with the ministry you are the head, with the business that you have, with the assignment in government, yes, you're going to debunk the Babylonian system, but you have to become head and not tail. You have to be above and not below. You have to be a giver and not a taker and listen to the Holy Spirit. I mean, having manna here sharing, I mean, the devil... He's being chewed up by his principalities. They never thought that this guy that was in the devil's pocket will be leading the charge to bring reconciliation between the community and police. When you come to California, you will see a version of Mana. This is a guy that spent most of his life in prison. When he was in prison, one of our daughters who were running our cassette tapes, remember millennials, cassette tape was something we used, no iPhone. She felt led to send it to San Quintin. And this guy got appeared to him and told him, I met the woman at the well, but I'll meet you in your cell. 
And if you have the visitation of God, God save, learn transformation before he learn anything else. And he looks like the devil, walks like the devil, almost talks like the devil, but he's a Christian. He's the best infiltration we have. <laughs> and that guy now is the advisor to the authorities on gang violence. And every time they say, shoot up, he's there. So, but because we have to grow, I want you to receive this. If God can take somebody that socially is disqualified to do what they are doing, he can do it for you. But it doesn't stop there. It fills the whole earth. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father for two things. One is active and the other is passive. He's actively interceding for you and me. He's passively waiting for everything to be put under his feet. He will not return until everything has been put under his feet. It doesn't say he will put it. It will be put under. By whom? By you. By the ecclesia. You will take Whatever is going on in Chinatown that does it align with the kingdom of God, and you will take the kingdom of God and you put it under the feet of Jesus. You will do that in education. You will do that in health care. And when the gospel of the kingdom has been proclaimed, say proclaim. proclaim. It doesn't say preach, proclaim. There's a big difference. Preach is blah, blah, blah. Proclaim is declaring the law of the land. Yes. Then the Lord will return. Yes. So you see how God has some bushes this morning? We came expecting something good and it turned out to be much better. Yeah. We expected to see something extraordinary and it's doubly, triple, extraordinary. <laughs> and we are not done yet because the eyes of the Lord are on you. The Lord is bragging about you. The Lord is telling his angels about you. The enemy of faith is memory. Memory reminds you of everything that went wrong. Faith is the revelation, the assurance of things to come. And God is saying to you, I have faith in you. And we are planting seeds. I didn't know 20 some years ago when I was here, and Alan Cardilla was in attendance at that seminar. I think Ralph Moore organized it. And I made the statement, when you die, will the city mourn you or not? Boom! Hit him. He said, yeah. If I die and all the pastors die, the city couldn't care less. Look how that seed is turning into a mountain. So folks, believe with me by faith. Believe that Hawaii is destined to be a light to the nations. I mean, in the last 200 years, this is the only nation, the only kingdom that was dedicated to God. And God never takes back what he gives. So therefore, let us also see such a cloud witness, lay aside the weight, the things that are not necessary if you're going to be running, but also the sin that is besetting us. And that's why you heard time and again, the accelerator, the accelerator, because the accelerator will train it, will train you, will give you the language. I was in a commando company in the army, and I was a very good shooter. You know, I almost qualify as a sharp shooter. I know a little bit about strategy, but my biggest asset was not my gun, that I knew it very well. I slept with it. My biggest asset was my earpiece because it was the language, the communication, the orders that came. And that's why doing the accelerator is key for you to know what is weight and what is sinful. And both of them has to be ejected. Sin will be very easy. But how many things we do in our daily life that are not suitable for that? And it says that we, the Ecclesia, overcame. I want you to receive that by faith. We shall overcome. But to overcome, we need the blood of the Lamb that is already shed, 
We need the word of our testimony that we are hearing. It's exciting. But there is a third thing where we are still a little bit undeveloped. We need to be willing to lay down our life. And by life, I mean our time, our money, our talents, everything. Lay it down. But we do that. Game is over for the devil. You see, the blood of the Lamb, you cannot argue with that. The word of our testimony is getting better and better. But this is the area where we have to come to this. So I want you to listen to the Holy Spirit now. I want you to look at every good thing that God has given you. And don't let that be an anchor that will hold you back. When you have nothing, God gave you everything. Not that you have a lot. Give it back to the Lord. Kingdom companies are good, but king's companies is better. A church that is doing the work of the Lord is good, but a church that becomes an ecclesia is better. So when we look at this, look at this equation. When culture finds a community, automatically, say automatically, automatically, produces a movement. Look at the Bolsheviks. I mean, if you haven't read any biography, read it. It was a bunch of desperados in Russia. I mean, Lenin was a chicken full of fear. But they found a community, the Bolsheviks, and it became a movement. Look at the French Revolution. I mean, they never stood the chance, but they found the community. What we are doing here, connecting East to West, learning from each other, honoring each other, we are building a community where the culture of the kingdom of heaven is modeled by all of us. And when we do that, that automatically produces a movement. The anointing that you're receiving is the equivalent of puberty. You didn't make an appointment to go to the doctor to give you a shot for puberty to begin. It hits you from within. <laughs> It changed the way you look at those silly girls or those stupid boys. <laughs> it altered your voice. You began to see hair grow when no hair before. Flat shades became curvy. Okay, that's what the anointing does. That's what you will receive in the last minute of this session. The breath of God. Adam was a piece of clay, dead matter, until... <sighs> God blew into his nostril, and the anointing turned the dead into a living matter. Open your heart. Tell the Lord, I want it. I want it. Be like the woman with the issue of blood. Keep pressing. Don't let tradition disqualify you because you're not supposed to touch a rabbi because you have an issue with blood. Go for it. That's why I'm so excited by what I see here. That's why I'm so excited about what began in Nanakuli. And it's no coincidence that now there is a, a rapid transit system beginning in Nanakuli and ending where? Waikiki. And there are Christians in authority there taking the presence, the power of God. I mean, the reason why Paul was so effective is because the Pax Romana, created roads that allow people to take the gospel. God is creating already a road from Nanakuli to Waikiki, okay, and beyond. I was so blessed, you know, every Thursday I have one hour with Francis Oda. He's the chairman of Transform Our World. We pray together. And then uh, when he began to tell me about him and Caroline's passion for Chinatown, you know, a place that you can look at it one or two different ways, right? But to turn that into an art center, you know, where the art of Hawaii, and then look at the transformation pastor that they anointed, an artist like Jocelyn. I'll tell you, the devil is losing already. So I want you to read with me again, okay? Loud and clear. 
One, two, three. God has promised once and for all, I will not only shape the systems of the world, but also the unseen power in the heavenly realms, so that only what is unshakable will remain. Since we have received an unshakable kingdom, we should be extremely thankful and offer to the Lord the purest worship that delights his heart as we lay down our lives in absolute surrender filled with all. For our God is a holy, devouring fire. I want you to pay attention to this. How would you like if you're worshiping God and God tells you, I like it. That's my favorite song. Can you sing it again? Right? How would you like that? Look what it says there. We should offer to the Lord the purest worship that delights his heart. And what is that? As we lay down our lives in absolute surrender. In absolute surrender. But not because it's the end of the road. Filled with awe because it's the beginning of the road. And when you surrender your life to God, filled with awe, our God is a devouring fire that burns every piece of weight and sin in your life. I pray that the Holy Spirit will impart to you the beauty of worshiping with gratitude. You know, I'm learning to do that. And, and there are so many more things as a visionary that I would like God to give me. And I ask for this and I ask for that. And sometimes I get it and sometimes I don't get it. But I learned to surrender to the Lord. Whether I have it or I don't have it, Lord, I'm going to worship you. And then I begin to thank God for the love of my life, my wife. I thank God for each one of our children and grandchildren. I thank God for the people we have the joy to minister to. I thank God for the roof over my head and the bed under my back and the food on my table. I thank God for people like Alan and, and, and others that they are gifts. I thank God that I met Crater. Look how rich we are. And then I began to feel that there is something sweet that goes into the presence of the Lord. And he says, Ed, give me seconds, seconds of gratitude. And when we do that, we are filled with awe. Because God is never passive. He likes what you are doing. So he's going to give you more. And he begins to burn things. Why? Because this is the final destination. Read that with me. One, two, three. Those from among you will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will raise up the age-old foundations. And you will be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets in which to dwell. Keep looking at the text. Faith comes by? Hearing. And hearing or reading? You tell me if that is not Nanakuli. Look, rebuild the ancient ruins. It was in ruins. Place up the old age foundation, solidarity among mankind. Repair the breach between the police and the hood. And restore of the streets in which to dwell. It was so cool, this about the grandmas, two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I mean, the devil is so confused, you know. He assigned <laughs> all his demons to every police officer, to every pastor, give a headache to the pastor. And, and God mobilizes grandmas. <laughs> I mean, even the cruelest criminals will not shoot the grandma. <laughs> you know, you see, 
We, this is where we are going. California is hurting. Remember to pray for California. You are very appreciative of me coming here, having come, say, Ed, thank you for coming. I need to beg you, come to California. We need you. It breaks your heart, the slum areas all over the place. I mean, the homeless people on addictions, the confusion in government that if you steal less than a thousand, is not punishable. And we had people ransacking shops with an adding machine. When they hit 900, that's it, and they leave. But God says, you're going to restore the streets in which to dwell. And you have proof here that you are doing this here. And now East and West are coming together. This is dynamite. So I want you to pause for a moment, and I want you to watch this in a moment. Please rewind it. The church, the word for church is ecclesia. Say ecclesia. Ecclesia is assembly. Say assembly. assembly. Every assembly to have binding authority needs a quorum. And the Lord established the lowest possible quorum. Two people, husband and wife, two friends if they are single, two co-workers. When I was studying the scriptures, I said, Lord, Jesus never made an idle promise. He says, anything you ask shall be given. Whatever you bind shall be bound. But then I look at my record. And if I got 30% of my prayers answered, I felt lucky. I will bind and will be loose the next day. And then God gave me this insight into the manifest presence of Jesus. That when two people, like those two grandmas, come together, they have the same presence of Jesus that you have in a gathering of 10,000 people. <laughs> And in Argentina, we have the equivalent of Nana Cooley called Barrio La Flores. And this is a place where the drug dealers run the place. But now these ladies, actually, they pray or walk the place with Jesus. And Jesus tells them, knock on that door and take me in. And they knock on the door and a very angry lady with a cock gun comes and says, I don't believe in divorce. They say, we don't either. No, no, you don't understand. I'm not going to wait for the word. I'm going to shoot my husband. And she turns around ready to shoot him. What can be more challenging than that, right? But these ladies bring the presence of Jesus. And this woman drops the gun and begins to cry. And she and her husband are reconciled. I mean, in council, it will take you three years to get to that point. They receive the Lord. They are filled with the Holy Spirit. They dedicate the home as an ecclesia. They manifest presence of Jesus. They were a couple blocks, and the Lord says, hey, I'm enjoying this walk. Knock on that door. It was a drug house. They... They said, we'd like Jesus to come in. The people began to weep. We don't want to do it, but we don't have a job. Well, repent. They did. Receive Jesus. But now we have a problem. We need to pay the dealer. So these Christians took an offering on the street and went with the drug seller to the drug dealer. He said, how much does she owe you? They cross it out. And don't bother them. Because now they are clean. We are cleaning up that neighborhood one house at a time. But it's not the principles. It's not the leaders. It's the manifest presence of Jesus. So I want you to watch this. And, and I'm sure this is being videotaped so people can get the video eventually. But watch it. And then I'll come back for the impartation, please. What is 
Christ in Ecclesia, in its most embryonic expression, listen carefully, is the gathering of at least two believers around the manifest presence of Jesus with authority to bind and to release for God's will to be done in their sphere of influence. That's the very heart of prayer. We pray according to the will of God, and the will of God is done. The basis for that is in the scriptures. That gives us reassurance. Matthew 18, verses 18 through 20 says, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loose in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered in my name, I am there in their midst. What the promise that anything we ask in the name of Jesus, the Father will do it. But the question is, why is it that we don't get a hundred percent of our prayers answers, as Jesus promised. And what is it that we bind and we release on earth, but it doesn't remain bound and released? Why? Look at this passage. There are three steps that you are required to take, and God will deliver three promises. Step number one, when two or three gather in his name, Jesus comes. What a promise. When anything they ask, they pray for on earth, is done by the Father in heaven. And the third step is that when they bind and release, they are empowered to bind and to release. So look at that. Three actions that we take, three promises that God delivers. If we call on the name of the Lord, he will come. Do you realize that now when you go to prayer, the Lord says, I will come. Where is he coming from? from the right hand of the Father. And what is he doing there? He has been interceding for you. So why is it that we don't get our prayers answered? Well, I asked the Lord that, and he says, Ed, you rush too quickly to pray, to request things, but you don't honor Jesus who is coming to be with you. If the Queen of England were to walk through the front door, what would you do? Oh, she will get my undivided attention. I will, you know, greet her, whatever you desire, your majesty. And God reminded me, my son is greater than the Queen of England. So now that changed my life. When I begin to pray with my wife, with a prayer partner, we take time welcoming the Lord Jesus. You know, we use 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves first and then pray. You see, I was rushing to prayer. No, take time to welcome the Lord Jesus. And then you seek his face and you turn from your wicked ways. Then and only then, God says, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal the land. Pay attention to that passage. We call on the name of the Lord, and at that moment we come under his lordship. We humble ourselves, we adore, we worship him, and then we begin to pray. And we seek his face first, and we turn from our own ways. You see, when we do that, listen carefully, the mind of Christ begins to impregnate your mind. Like if the Queen of England comes and she asks for a cup of tea, you will run to get it. If you welcome Jesus and you listen to him, you will begin to think his thoughts. And at that moment, we are renewed in the spirit of our mind, not just on the soul side of our mind, but on the spirit side, what comes from God. And then we begin to pray the prayers that Jesus has been praying at the right hand of the Father. And when we do that, 100% of those prayers are answered. And we are able to bear fruit, much fruit, and fruit that remains. Look what Jesus said in John 15, verse 7. If you abide in me, remember, he comes, he manifests himself in your prayer meeting, and my words, the ones that I'm talking to you, my words abide in you. Now you know how to pray. And now you ask, and whatever you wish, 
it will be done for you. Awesome, awesome. You see, the deeper meaning of praying is not talking, it's abiding, it's basking in his presence, it's sensing his presence. Take time as you go to prayer to celebrate the presence of Jesus and to listen to him. He may speak to you from a passage in the Bible. He may speak to you through your prayer partner. He may speak to you through a thought that pops up, but you will know that it comes from God. And look at this verse. Truly I say to you, whatever, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loose in heaven, so that we will be binding on earth what the Father and the Son already bound in heaven. That's different than what we were doing before. Because look at the picture. The Father is the principal figure. Jesus is in our midst when we gather for prayer. He's like a mirror. We look to Jesus and we see what the Father is doing. And then we are able to see what the Father is doing through the presence of Jesus And now we are able to pray prayers that the Father will answer. And at that moment, we are given authority to bind and to release because the God of peace will soon crush Satan under our feet. There is a spiritual warfare going on. And God is giving us the authority to bind and to release. But we shouldn't rush there. First, we welcome Jesus. We bow before him. We abide in his words. We pray the prayers that he guides us to pray. The Father answers that. And now we discover what the Father has already bound in heaven or loose in heaven. And we do it here. And God crushes Satan. All forms of evil under our feet. Whose feet? The ecclesia. Who is the head of the ecclesia? Jesus. Where is Jesus? At the right hand of the Father. But now the Holy Spirit comes and reveals himself. Look at this promise. He, the Holy Spirit, will guide you. Oh, this is so key in prayer. Will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose it to you what is to come. What will he reveal to you? Listen carefully. What the Holy Spirit hears, the Father and the Son, binding and loosing. Doesn't this change prayer and makes it more dynamic? And now we are asking God for the anointing because the anointing is what makes the difference. Gideon without the anointing was a coward. Gideon with the anointing became a mighty man of God. The anointing is the breath of God, is the presence of God in your prayer meeting that that revives everything in you. Samuel without the anointing was a miraculous baby. But with the anointing, he became the greatest prophet in Israel. David, without the anointing, was a lovely shepherd. With the anointing, a mighty and prolific king. Oh, my friend, listen to the Holy Spirit. This is how Paul put it. For in him we live. In him we move. In him we exist. That changes prayer, right? That is like being a fish in the water. When you gather now, celebrate the presence of Jesus. Exalt the presence of Jesus. Realize you live in him. You move in him. You exist in him. And now you abide in his words because he will speak to you. Either by the written word, through your prayer partner, through a sensation. But it will be a two-way street. And that's why I pray that you will emulate Mary. When Mary didn't know how what the angel was announcing will come to pass, she asked, how can this be? And the angel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and he will deposit something in you. And I pray that right now the Holy Spirit comes upon you and teaches you how to pray. In Jesus' name, cry with me, Holy Spirit, Baptize me. Yes, let's do it. Amen. So in conclusion, 
Do you see how vital it is to have a prayer partner? If you are married, your spouse, if he or she is a believer, a niece, a nephew, a co-worker. These two grandmas illustrate that. They take the presence of Jesus, the policeman and the former gang leader. But what I try to show you is that you can get 100% of your prayers answered if you listen to the Lord what to pray for. So in conclusion now, we should be extremely thankful and offer to the Lord the purest form of worship as we lay down our lives in absolute surrender. What is happening here today is unprecedented. I see Pastor Creighton as a male modern-day expression of Lydia. Lydia was a businesswoman, somebody who feared God. She heard the teaching. Pastor Creighton heard about Nana Cooley. And what did Lydia do? She opened her household and had her household baptized into what Paul was teaching. Look at this. This venue is a dream. The media support, the gentleness, the hospitality. Why? I mean, Pastor Creighton could go on with what he's doing. He's a successful leader. But he says, I want this. I want Nana Kuli. I want my people to be baptized in this. This is extraordinary. Because the first level of transformation, you get transformed. The next one, you take it to your sphere and you talk about it. And that inspires other people to be transformed and take it to their sphere. But unfortunately, most people park it there. T.O.W., we go two levels up. You join others to build something bigger than what you have. And you become a novice at something you don't know rather than remain an expert at something you already know. <laughs> and when you succeed, you give it away. Folks, this is the most sacred moment of the whole morning. I would like the people from Nana Cooley, would you raise your hand so I can see you? And keep it up, keep it up, don't be bashful about it. Amen? Can I ask those that are part of C4 to raise your hand. Yes, good, that's so lovely. And then there are in between a lot of people. So I would like for us to take a moment now and to emulate the Virgin Mary. If you think you're overwhelmed this morning after all this teaching and all these examples, Try to put yourself in the shoes of Mary. God says, you're going to have a child with me. So she asked the question, how can that be? And there was only one phrase, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. He will overpower you, and he will deposit the seed the way he did when Alan Cardenas heard me say, when you die, will the seed demon you? And in due time, it will come. So if you're ready to say what Mary said, let the will of God be done. And that was done in idle promise because if a girl was caught in fornication, and that's the way it looked, humanly speaking, she had no husband, he had a bride promised to her, the baby will begin to show, she would have been stoned to death. But she said, let the will of God be done. Then God provided a census for them to leave town, for the baby to be born. There were no iPhones. No one knew what the age of the baby was. They have to flee to Egypt to gain a few extra years. So when he came back, no one knew when the baby was born. But she was willing to say, let the will of God be done. So can I 
I want to issue this invitation on my knees for you to capture my heart. The future of Hawaii hangs on the balance. If you're willing to run whatever risk to be a channel, would you stand up with both hands lifted up and tell God, God, let your will be done in me. Let your will be done in me. Tell him that. Tell him that. Lord, let your will be done in me. Tell him that. Let your will be done in me. Forget about me. Talk to God. He said, Lord, let your will be done in me. Like in the worship at the beginning, from we were focused, shouted, Lord, let your will be done in me. Like Bartimaeus cried, don't pass me by, Lord. I want what Creighton has. I want what Allen has. I want what Cal has. I want what Caroline and Frank. Lord, I want it. Shout it. I want it. And now the Holy Spirit is coming up on you. And he's overpowering you. And he's dividing the soul from the spirit so that your heart will be purified by the baptism. Father, in the name of Jesus, baptize them right now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. And say, let the will of God be done. Amen. Amen, amen, and amen. Okay? You know, uh, I, I have a really strong word. In Hawaii, the godliest people to bring forth and break out the anointing was our women. Beginning with Kiopu Alani and Kaumanu, along with Liho Liho, breaking out the great awakening of Hawaii. And today, you heard incredible women speak. <clears throat> when you take the Ecclesia Accelerator, you're going to hear Poncho Murugia, along with Brian Burton, pray over Ciudad Juarez and bring, and that turned around Ciudad Juarez. What you don't hear is that began with the women of Ciudad Juarez wailing and crying out for Ciudad Juarez it, just a day, few days before. And it was out of their cry and their wail that Ed said, take this anointing, and he anointed Brian and he anointed Poncho to pray over Ciudad Juarez. I have this great sense that the Wahine of Hawaii Amen. This Amen. is not going to It's not going to happen without our wahine. Without the women taking their rightful place. You heard Jody and you heard Ivalani speak. Whenever I talk to Jody, I feel like saluting her that she's a general. I'm talking to a general. In fact, we call her General Jody. <laughs> you know, I heard Chadwick say a few months ago, he said, when he heard about this, he said, Every morning, I ask my wife to put her hand on my chest and pray for me before I go out. Right, Chad? And he said, and when, when they forget, he go, he go back in the house. Hey, you forgot, we forgot. Can we close up today by asking our women of Nanakuli to pray over us? Would that be okay? Would you want to receive this? Would we want to receive this? Jesus was the greatest man on earth and continues to be, but he came forth from a woman. He came forth from Mary on earth. And so I, I just felt like somehow our wahine plays such a key role here in Hawaii. And if I'm going to ask Jody and Ivalani along with uh, Mari Cardenas, if you can come up here. 
and pray for the rest of us. Would that be okay? And we receive this word. Father, we just come before you, Lord, with just a heart of gratitude that you met us here and you knew exactly what we needed to hear, Father God. I believe that here at C4 is the point of inception, Lord God, to see radical transformation on the east side. And we are so humbled and grateful that we are a part of it, Lord. You know the areas that we influence. So I ask you, Father, that your Holy Spirit will be generous. Your portion will be so great, Lord God. And you will go before us, Lord. Before we even get there, Lord, people will be transformed. I thank you so much, Lord, that what we have, you have seeded in our hearts, that we can just um, deposit. And we just pray, Father God, as Father Ed just scattered so generously. You know what we need and that we have to be able to just glean it, Father God, and just take it to where you have called us to. Father, we know that our families are worth fighting for and we need them, Father, on the front line. So as we go out there in battle, bring our families alongside of us. Teach us how to love them the way that they're going to receive it, Lord God. Help us, Lord, to do something fresh. Teach us, Father God, of just being able to disciple your nation. Thank you so much, Holy Spirit, for allowing me to just speak this blessing over my family. In your mighty name, Jesus. Father, I just thank you for the seed that you sown in my mother's womb, Father God, not knowing who I was going to be as I grew up, Father God. I just thank you, Lord, and I just ask that you pray over all the, all the grandmas, all of the grandmas. It, it started from when we were just a seed in our mother's womb. And I just thank you, and I lift up all these grandmas that come. I call them, and they come. If I don't call them, they're still calling me if we can go out. Father, I just lift them all up to you, and I ask that you just cover your blood from the head to the toes, Father God. I thank you for the strength that you give them to come out weekly, monthly. This is our 18th year doing this, Father God, and I just thank you, Lord Jesus, for all the grandmas. I thank you that we're now busting out of District 8 and going into yes. all the districts in the yes. island, yes. Father, and the outer island, yes. and to Argentina. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord. Oh, Heavenly Father, today we just glorify you, Lord. We take it from the north, the south, the east, and the west, from the grandmas to the aunties, to the uncles, to the kanes, to the keikis, to the kapuna, Lord. I thank you. What is needed, Father God, is not just a transformation. It's a revelation, Father God. It's a revelation of your word, Father God, that you spoke and the earth was made, Father God. Today... Aloha is in every one of us, Father God. And I thank you today that the seed that you are planting and that the transformation, Lord, will be going global today. Father God, will be going, going global, Lord. That we thank you, Lord, that every church, Father God, will come together. And I pray for, yes, the grandmas, Father God, because we are the backbone, Father God. We go forward. We, we become the upright for all, Lord. We take back, Lord, our marriages. We take yes. back our community. Yes. We, we place in every government agencies, Lord, and every count, count in every county, Father God, that the change is coming because we today declare a change, Father God. Not just individually, God, wholeheartedly with the body of Christ because it's not about churches, Lord. It's about you, Father God. And let the aloha reign, Father God. Reign not just in our family, Father God. Not just in our communities, Father God. But it will ring from the north, the south, the east of the west, Father God. To all the different countries, Father God. And I thank you that this is the day that you have made, Father God. 
And I pray that you ask, and I ask you, Lord, that every spoken and unspoken prayer, Father God, that you answer today, Lord. I thank you that you give the strength for all of us today, us women, Father God, and all the churches, Lord, that today a change is coming and that we're going to bust the moon for you, Jesus. <laughs> we're going to bust the moon. We will not, we will not tarry, Lord. But I thank you for the vision from Papa Ed. Yes, Lord. Pastor Cal, Pastor Creighton, and my awesome Pastor Allen, that he created in us soldiers, women of the word, warriors for you, Lord, that this fight will be to my last breath, Lord, for you, Lord, to call back the people to you, to heal a hurting world and the devastation of Maui in a small island, Lord, that all will see and know that you are the God of the universe, yes. of the creator, Lord, Ooh. that you have chosen Hallelujah. us this day. Mm. And, it, and only if it's a few of us, we will make an impact globally. So today, Lord, we just ask you, Holy Spirit, to continue to move within us and guide us and be with us and continue to multiply your people to do your will, Lord. We ask all of this to your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.